What's up, everybody? All right, today's giveaway, Maps Strong. This was a Maps workout program we designed with a world's strongest man competitor, Robert Oberst, giant human being, very strong. We put this program together. It's fun, and it's free for one of you viewers. Here's how you can win. Leave a comment in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Turn on your notifications and subscribe to this channel. Do all those things. If we like your comment, we'll notify you and get free access to Maps Strong, okay? Also, we're running a sale right now on two very popular MAPS workout programs. The first one is MAPS Performance. This is an athletic-minded workout program. So train like an athlete, perform like an athlete, look like an athlete, unconventional workouts and exercises, a lot of fun. The other program that's on sale is MAPS Aesthetic. That's a bodybuilder-style workout program for balance and symmetry and body sculpting and building. Again, both 50% off. Here's how you can sign up. For MAPS Performance, go to mapsgreen.com. For Maps Aesthetic, go to mapsblack.com. And then the code for both of them for 50% off is FEB50. Again, FEB50 gives you 50% off either Maps Performance or Maps Aesthetic. All right, here comes the show. When you're trying to find a good trainer or coach, the most important thing to look at is their experience. Nothing will tell you more about how good the trainer is than that. Ooh, yeah. you know, you're going to piss off a lot of um, people that value um, their four-year degree they spent getting their yeah. their kinese yeah. degree or their sports medicine degree by saying that, something like that. Yeah, controversial. Yeah, no, it, okay, so, okay. Well, me. I mean, it, it, it is to a point because somebody who's gone through four years of schooling or more is going to feel like, wait a second, how are you going to say that, that that is less valuable than some kid mm -hmm. who has no education who's just getting experience? Well, so, first off, I'm not saying that other uh, factors shouldn't be considered. So I think education is important as well. Right. What I'm saying is if the, the one most important factor is experienced. Yeah, okay. So gotcha. an experienced, educated you know, coach or trainer is going to be great. But it's if you are looking at a educated coach who's got a, you know, a degree, a master's degree or whatever, and you compare them to a trainer or coach who's got equal amount of time but as experienced training people like you mm – -hmm. the experienced person is more likely – this isn't a guarantee, of course. There's crappy people on all sides – but they're more likely to do a better job. And that largely has to do with the fact that when you're coaching, the most important aspect of what makes you successful is not necessarily the information that you know, but rather how you apply it and how you mm -hmm. help the person through the process. Like, for example, when you're talking about diet, you know, I, I, it's very easy to Google diet, how to lose weight, macros, what has proteins, what has fat, what has carbs, that kind of stuff. But what's hard is to figure out how to modify behaviors, how to be consistent, how to develop a better relationship with food. That comes from experience. And the experience that you get from working with lots of different people is what teaches you that. It yeah. doesn't come from learning kind of general, you know, okay, this well, it's is- pattern recognition. Yes. I mean, a lot of it is really paying attention to how you need to alter and adjust and, and be able to, uh, you know, uh, appropriately apply a more successful plan, which- isn't something you technically um, are fluid with when you're learning just from books and in, in isolated kind of environments where, you know, it's it's in a laboratory setting where this is like how, you know, it, it, it is sort of laid out versus somebody that comes in with so many different variables you have to work through. You're almost more of a detective at that point. Well, the, the science and knowledge is, is very accessible to everybody now, mm -hmm. which is very different than what it was just 20 years ago where... You know, even your client could easily Google whatever it is that they're trying to find out as far as the answer. But uh, where the the experience part, and you talk about this a lot, is that that's where the wisdom comes in, right? Like, how do you take that, distill that down into something that's uh, practical and applicable to the client, and then how to implement that into their lifestyle? That's just that's practice, right? Well, that's me, something that you've you've had to try and probably yes. fail at multiple times before you kind of figure it out. Um, a lot of it is, I feel like kind of what we talk about on the show, it's, you know, it's, uh, yes, the, our education, uh, and everything that we've read over the last two or three decades, right. Is, is important. I mean, we have to be able to have some, some knowledge base, uh, but really it's the, how and what we decide to communicate to the client. I think that, uh, it makes it more well, effective well, as far as your too, coaching. As you're applying it is where all the questions come up for you to then try to pursue more education uh, to get more knowledge that you can then bring back in 
uh, versus like, you know, trying to learn everything and then not really knowing uh, what's going to be valuable. Or so not. let me ask you guys this then. Do you think that it's more or less important because all the information is more accessible today than it was, again, a couple decades ago, is it more or less important to have a coach today than it was two or three decades ago? Oh, I see what you're saying. Mm -hmm. I think it's always been important. Mm -hmm. um, well, that's obvious because the, the profession has been around. But, More or less? I yeah. don't know. That's a good question. Because um, sometimes I think Because that you know why? Lots of information. Okay, here, here, here's a fact now. We have access to more information today than ever before. And it's not even close. If, if I had a question about something when I was a kid, I had to literally go to the library yeah, and look it up and find a book and then go home and oops, I have another question. Got to go back to the library. There was nowhere I could go. Like right now on my phone, I have access to all of the recorded information of all of human history, right? Uh, potentially. Have we seen a decrease in obesity? Have we seen an improvement in health? Have we seen more consistency with exercise? No, we've seen it go down. It's not an information problem. It's an application problem. For mm -hmm. example, to lose weight, you need to eat less calories than you burn most people understand this or know this, or at least have heard this. Why aren't they doing it? It has nothing to do with the information. It has everything to do with the stuff that coaches, experienced coaches bring to the table. And then I'll ask you guys this. You guys know a lot about exercise and nutrition and science around training. What percentage of all that information would you apply to yeah. the average client? Yeah. Like mm -hmm. 1%? Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not going to take the average person and you know, there's all this advanced training knowledge on hypertrophy and fat loss and sleep. And I'm gonna take like 1% of it and apply yeah. it to the individual. It's, it's just, it's, it's, not, it's important, but the experience aspect is the most important well, thing. Well, you can almost make the case that there's more pathways for the average person today than there was two or three years ago, which means that it would probably be more necessary to have a guide today. To help sift at least? That's what I mean. Because there's so there's there's yeah. so I mean even we see this even in uh, with studies like how often is like one study contradict another study and there's so much information that's out there that it could probably become overwhelming for the average person and easily led down the wrong path because they they think they know but they don't right yeah. so you could almost make the case well, that it's needed. Yeah, there's more. very compelling arguments out there for um, they'll they'll extract like one piece of science that uh, they'll highlight. And then, you know, make it very convincing that this is the only way you need to train and for, um, you know, nutritional pursuits. Like, this is the only way you need to eat and, you know, have very good uh, evidence and support with their argument, but it's not the whole picture. Yeah. Okay. So it's no different than this, right? It's no different than the business professor who's teaching at a, you know, esteemed university who's been teaching business to students for a long time versus the business person who's opened and, you know, businesses and failed yeah, and succeeded. Very, very similar. Yeah. Who is going to, who's more likely to start a business and succeed and, and do those things, right? It's going to be the person with the experience. Sure. It's not the professor. Does that mean the professor has no value? No, it doesn't. Uh, it's, they're very valuable. But when you're picking a coach or a trainer, it, it, if you're, when you're weighing things out, experience is the most important uh, by far. And look, we, 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 trained people for a long time. We were considered among some of the most successful trainers, I guess, in our area, right here in the Bay Area. In our circle of in our 10 circle. friends. Yeah, that's how we kind of knew of each other. <laughs> <laughs> there was like 10 of us. Yeah, <laughs> but, but we, you know, we, we did pretty well. We're three of the best five that we know. Yeah, Dude, we're yeah. like top three. Yeah, out of the, top, out of the four. No, but serious, all, you know, all joking aside, so we did pretty well and we knew and we saw people, trainers come and go. Yeah, and we yeah. hired trainers to, and well, now when you hired a trainer, what was more important for you to look at? Right? Yeah, but do you, so <clears throat> I actually um, remember learning this lesson. So when I first- I did the same thing, I know what you're going to say. When I first got into management, I actually went after the, you know, I had a, I've had a PhD work for me. I had, I had plenty mm -hmm. of people with their masters and of course, lots of bachelors in science. And so I, I went after that. Like I would actually go down to the, the call, local college and actually look for kids that just came out with their kines or- <laughs> <clears throat> excuse me, or their sports medicine degree, right? And uh, I tried to build a team around like the most educated trainers. And really, I sought after that because I wasn't. I didn't finish my Kines degree. And I thought, man, imagine if I could find a bunch of these trainers that are far smarter than mm -hmm. I am in, in mm -hmm. the field. Like we're going to be, we're going to be dominant. And what happened was it, um, 
it was difficult, dude. It was really difficult to succeed with this this group of trainers that I had that were all really, really smart because a lot of them failed at the application process mm -hmm. later on in my career. And and this was, by the way, too, I'm, I'm like skipping over years of kind of learning this lesson, you know, over and over. But eventually I came to the conclusion I would rather have somebody with no fitness knowledge that I could teach how to train clients the way that I have learned over years of practicing all mm -hmm. this over having somebody with a master's or even a PhD in the field. Like that's how much I would rather have a, a, a trainer that I could teach mm -hmm. that that part didn't, but it took me years of like, Oh, like this maybe to be this smart guy or this smart yeah. girl. Oh, well, I keep look, trying. I don't, I don't care how, uh, you know, whether you're super educated or not, you're not the best trainers I ever worked with were train were people who trained for at least five years. It would take five years yeah. mm -hmm. for them to really get really good. Mm -hmm. And you know, here's how you know, right? You ask a trainer a question, and if they have the answer right away, and they don't answer with "it depends,", depends then you know they don't have a lot of experience. When you you know you're you know it's funny because like I remember we we interviewed like Joe DeFranco, excellent. I mean, one of the best trainers out there, somebody we all looked up to back in the day. And I remember he first came on the show, and I would and we heard, and we were interviewing him, and he kept answering with "it depends." And I remember like, oh yeah, of course, because. He has a lot of experience working with a lot of different people. Yeah. You know, Brett Contreras would answer the same way. It depends. And that's what you hear. So oftentimes, if you don't have the experience, but you have the, the knowledge or the information, then the answer is, you know, well, this is what the study shows, so here's the answer. Well, mm -hmm. I've also found, too, that the, when I got a lot of, and by the way, too, this is just my own experience. I'm not saying this is the way it is for everybody, but what I had found is a, a, the trainers that were that had these had this education when they would come in and they're just starting the profession, they have this education in the field, but they have no experience in the, the actual field. And sometimes it would it would get in their way. Yeah, their expectations were different. Were I I, des I should already be crushing. Yeah, yeah. Or I know better because this is what the science says, and mm -hmm. it's like, well, we're also dealing with behaviors too, right? So well, there's, there's and a, then they don't relate to their uh, clients that are coming in, right? They talk, or they yeah, talk down to them, uh, and they use a lot of anatomical terms, and they, you know, it, unfortunately, they lean hard on that instead of really trying to connect and pull their client in and find out, you know, how to communicate in such a way to, to move their behaviors in a better direction. Right. When we all start, we're all insecure in a way, yeah. right? Like you, you, we, it's new, even for the educated trainer, it's still a, a new profession. Yeah. So, and their way of handling their insecurity a lot of time is to double and triple down on the education piece. Well, I'm only so, saying that because this was like something I struggled through initially because I did come from, you know, like from a college degree in uh, kinesiology. And I had, you know, this understanding of uh, how everything was going to work out, biomechanics, you know, ergogenic aids. I took all the courses, all the different things and, and ran a lab, you know, at school. And so it was a very much a, a um, you know, a science sort of an environment where everything was sort of, you know, set up. So it's going to be played out. So it's predictive, but then getting into the gym setting, you threw, I threw everything out. Like yeah. it just did not work out. Now there is something though that it, where if you don't have the education where you could really get yourself in trouble, you guys remember a couple years ago, I brought up that girl, Brittany Dawn. You remember her? Yeah. Yeah, I do. She's that, she that was fitness a, influencer. She was a fitness influencer. I, I, well, you know, whatever, she was selling whatever online the programs, means, right? So yeah, she no, was. I hate a, that term. Uh, so she was a fitness influencer, and she had a, a pretty large following, uh, and she started selling um, online digital programs and diets that were, you know, quote unquote, custom. Uh, and what they what ended up happening was she she blew up as far as her growth, and she was selling tons of these. And it got to a place where she definitely was not making custom plans at all. She was doing these cookie cutter type mm -hmm. of diets. So I brought her up a couple of years ago because this, it made the news as a big yeah. deal, right? <clears throat> well, uh, after that, she made this like hard, like religious pivot, you know, then she began like, you know, quoting Bible verses all the time. And she kind of went that angle uh, for her audience and like stayed away from like the nutrition, obviously advice because she got blasted. But guess what just happened? What just came in the news just like a couple of weeks ago. What? So uh, the state of Texas is coming after her and suing her because she had people that like had eating disorders and stuff that she was giving these unbelievably low calorie oh, diets. Gosh. And I supposedly hurt a lot of people that Oof. were in this position. And now wow. the state of Texas is coming after her and actually suing her. 
That crazy? That is insane. And I feel like so that's an area where like in well, that's, in, that's, in, in school you're they're gonna they're gonna teach you like some of the the foundational principles like legal principles that you got. Well, be two careful. things. <laughs> Hold on a second. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna defend something for a second because y yes, and some of the craziest shit I've ever seen prescribed came from doctors and uh, you know medical experts with my clients. I had clients on 500 calorie a day shakes, no food, yeah. prescribed by their doctor. So it's not always perfect. Now, why does experience, why is experience so good? Eventually you get found out. Eventually this girl got found out. Like you can rip off so many people, yeah. and, but if you're a coach or a trainer for 10 years and you're successful, you're probably doing a good job, right? Yeah. It's, you're not going to last 10 years and to, because people are going to find out. They say, oh, this person's full of crap or look what they've done or what. You might last a little while, but it's not like the old well, days. Well, not to mention that it, in order for you to make, I used to say the same thing too. I, like if I met somebody that had that kind of experience in our, but the reason why I used to say it is because there's very little money in our profession. Yeah. And if you've been doing it for two, three, four, five years and you're not making very much money, you normally bail. Yeah. Very few people yeah. make little to no money in this profession and stick around for 10 years. So if you mm -hmm. stuck around for 10 years, many times you figured it out, right? Mm -hmm. Or you figured it out enough to where you're still doing it. Otherwise, you'd be off doing something else. I do find it funny that she went the religious route <laughs> with promotion. And I you do. know what? I mean, there's I, a lot of there's a lot of like similarities with the ability, you know, manipulating people through religion or manipulating through the fitness cult. It's very similar. Well, we it? saw this in that uh, what was that cult? Oh, the, the documentary. Documentary uh, you you turned us on to. It was uh, Courtney and I just finished it where they combined like weight loss uh, with being closer to, to God. Like, what, like, the way down? Was that what it was called? Oh, yeah. The, the way, way down. down. The yeah. way down. Oh, I got to yeah. watch this. It's, you, it's haven't, so, you haven't finished watching it? No, I haven't we seen watched it. Oh, you didn't watch no, it? Now, what's it on? What platform is it on? Um, I think HBO. it's on HBO. Oh, yeah. good. Okay. Yeah, it's on HBO. It. It's on HBO. Is that the one with the lady with the big hair? Yeah, huge yes. hair. Uh, yeah. yeah. And it was somebody uh, Somebody in my DMs, which I, man, I love when, when I get stuff like this, right? So I, pr I appreciate people know what we talk about, what we're interested in. Somebody sent me over. I had never heard of it. It didn't pop up. By the way, that's my 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 critique of uh, HBO. I know I I, I always kind of crap on Netflix and say that HBO and Disney are going to catch them and stuff like that. But one thing that Netflix did really really well is their UI. I mean, their their all the, the recommendations. Stuff? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just the just the user interface is so user friendly. I mean, it's the way they categorize it and it rotates through stuff. HBO is not good like that. Like this is something that uh, you know should be yeah. kind of recommended. It wouldn't or wouldn't even have been in my like sphere. Otherwise, yeah, if you hadn't told me, it about wasn't. It. I had to actually go, like I couldn't even find it looking for it. I had yeah. to go to the search, put the whole title in, and then I found so it. So what now in this? What did they do? They combine diet with religion. So yeah. it was under that like protected tax free right so basically yeah it's like intuitive eating but like they're praying in between right and they're like uh, trying to it was aggressive fasting yeah aggressive fasting but making like so the spiritual side which makes sense but like now they're like they're programming it so it's literally part of the weight loss uh program and the oh. structure of it and so people would you know buy into this and they have all these services around it and then they give you all these rigid rules and you know it just becomes this thing where it becomes a really rigid form of you know the original doctrine it's kind of brilliant okay it's first of all it's well you know it's, it's, it's not the first time they the people have made diets based off of well it was it's time. the it's the one meal a day and you can eat as much as you want and then all the rest of the times when you have the desire to eat, you pray, you pray it away because yeah. that's, that's, that is the, I mean, I, I can see how that strategy. Oh no, it's bad. brilliant. Yeah. I mean, it's really brilliant. Well, people because, are losing weight, you oh, know? And so it's like, it's, they buy into the thing well, and then mm -hmm. she creates like this whole other version of what she views Christianity. Well, now I'm not going to defend it, but what I will say is psychologically speaking, the most effective way to stick to an extreme diet is to make it a part of your belief system. Sure. For yeah. example- That's why it's brilliant what she did. For example, uh, if you look at vegans, so I that eat no animal products whatsoever, vegans who do it because they believe that any any kill, killing any right. animal or Anything milking is animal- Is cruel. Is cruel. Like they're yeah. to that's the whole reason why they're vegans is because I believe that animals should not be treated that way at all. Their consistency is so much better than vegans who do it for health reasons, who right. say, oh, I want to be a vegan because I think it's, I don't want to eat meat. And they, they go off all the time. 
And it's because it's a belief system. The mm-hmm. people who's like, no, it's hurt animals. Even if they're nutrient deficient, they show up with nutrient deficiencies. Even if it causes a problem, they'll stick to it because it's a belief system. Yeah. So you tie it to religion, and yeah, you're <laughs> you're gonna be. And consistent. I I believe both you know Brittany Dawn and this girl we're talking about right now. I believe that it starts from a good place. I really do. Like I I mean I just that's I I believe I want to believe. That. Yeah, but then it becomes too much about themselves. Yeah, then that's where the narcissism yes, kicks in. Narcissism right? takes over, and whatever they were promoting is completely distorted by yeah. their own ideas that that uh, come through. Yeah, I think it starts off as a good because think about this. I mean. Uh, we haven't. I don't think I've ever told a client to go pray when these happens, but I, I have told them about trying to becoming present in the moment yeah. and realizing that this is a craving that you're you're battling yeah. right now, and be aware of the yeah. like where your mental state is yeah, and, and don't prayer, be distracted. And prayer is, I mean, you're being present, right? Yeah. I mean, it's it's a form of meditation in a sense, becoming as present as you possibly can. So, you know, it's it's pretty good advice to a point, right? But I think, and I and I think that's why I had so much success for the the congregation. Mm-hmm. But then I think that the narcissism takes over of like, because then she gets celebrated. She starts to get celebrated as oh, being so amazing, and look at all these people that I'm losing all this weight mm, and yeah. changing their life. I need and then to start she, my own church, you know, and then it becomes that, and then you get all these people behind you. I and, thought you you have to watch it. Yeah, it's really fascinating. Why do I have to watch it's it? Fascinating. Because you'll you like it. It's, I mean, it's a it's a crazy, intriguing story. It's got a there is a, a major twist to it. I just yeah, remember the girl because like, it gets darker and darker. The, yeah, she's is. like she looks like the like you know how you watch the righteous gems, gemstones and yeah. they were a parody of the yeah year. yeah yeah. It's she very looks much like, in that vein. Yeah, like the big yeah. hair and she's it's on. Very much. Yeah, I, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if the part of righteous gemstones was based off of some of her character and and that. Yeah, and was, me, yeah. They, they, they took that and like the televangelists and they sort of just totally. smashed it all together. Oh yeah. man. Yeah. yeah no. Speaking of hair, dude. Uh, so I don't I don't want to call anybody out, but the that test that we were supposed to do where we're supposed to put <laughs> dude it's a it's like a, such a cock block bro, i'm just gonna put it out oh there. yeah no i, 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 I want to hear about this day uh ruined everything. so <laughs> just so, so we know. get these tests not gonna say who it's from what's going on but we're supposed to get, put a hair sample in there and they're gonna measure things like heavy metals and stuff in our system through the hair right yeah and they want you to cut like I'm like I'm not gonna cut hair off my head for this like, you know, like <laughs> so you get like a patch just yeah. missing. Well, well, now, now it says well, on the test. Well, originally we think it's like a a hair sample, like and one hair. Yeah, yeah, I'm you, thinking you like pluck, a hair. That no, you got to put a chunk of hair. Yeah, they have this little uh, well, scale, like a substantial amount. Yeah, you have like this little. This, it's like a like it comes with a little cardboard scale thing, right? That. You have to put enough hair to where it tips it the other way, yeah. which ends up being like a mound of hair. Yeah, yeah. And I was hair telling Katrina, yeah. who is organizing all this right with the company, and you know she literally drops it on us yesterday and says, "Hey, I need this within 24 hours." I'm like, "You literally have three hosts that ha- I mean, I'm bald, so, <laughs> yeah. so I've got like, options I I no are hair. limited." Yeah, yeah. I'm like, hey, so I got 24 hours to come up with that much hair. Like, you're yeah. not going to get it from my head. You're going to get it yeah. from somewhere else. Yeah. Like, and then you want I'm me like, to take I'm a shave, man. a patch of my yeah. beard out, so I've got like this chunk. Like, and then it says on there you can use other body hair. So like yeah. I, last night, I'm over there like. Trimming my like stomach and chest hair to make it happen. You know? This dude over here has his wife on Valentine's Day shaving yeah. his armpit. Oh, that's oh, a- she's <laughs> cutting my armpits. She's just disgusted. I'm like, bro, you know? you're and so I'm not like, getting sex I'm like, come tonight. on, babe. Like, it's not a big deal. You know, it's just hair. And, and, and what happened? And then she's like, yeah, it's not. You didn't have it. no Valentine's sex she's because not, of it. Not of course it. not. <laughs> I'm like, motherfucker, dude. Yeah. I, you know what though? Respect though for your your dedication to the business. I got to give you that. Hey, you know, you what I'm know saying? like you just, you just I appreciate that she too, Valentine's Day sport, sex is some of the best sex, and you just threw it out the window for for this you know yeah. stupid study oh, we got to do. Man. Yeah. I've definitely missed out. That's hilarious. Well, definitely I mean, we'll see what happens. We'll see if it's accepted because. If not, I mean, that's what you're going to get. The next yeah. one I'm going to send in is hair from somewhere you don't want. So yeah. that's all I'm going to say. Yeah, yeah, no, I thought that was pretty But it's funny. funny. I'm like, you know, in the bathroom, and Jessica's cracking up because it's not like I'm doing an even job. I'm like, it's late. I'm going to bed. I'm like, fuck it. So I got like stripes of hair missing off my, off my body. I'm like, yeah. this is... This is hilarious, but I'm always yeah. suspicious with tests like this. You know, I'm like, what are they going to find? Like, yeah, we'll see. Yeah, we'll, they going to clone me? Are, yeah, yeah. Am I going to see some kid that looks just like me in the future? <laughs> what the stupid, hell? Stupid. Is that me right there? Anyway, <laughs> dude, I got to tell you guys something. So, uh, this I, I'm in a new stage of fatherhood, right? So, my oldest son has a driver's license, right? Sixteen, he's driving now, 
and the level of worry oh god goes up because <laughs> especially it's especially for you oh they, bro no do, well, let me tell you what happens is he allowed to drive by i don't know the rule yeah. isn't it like 18 where like you find drive by yourself or is no it, only by yourself until you're oh, 18 only by or so if, you don't do passengers no okay. or you have to drive with someone who's 18 or older so the person in the car with you right. has to be 18 or older or you're allowed to drive a sibling, but they have to have a release. Do you guys know that the history of that of that law? That happened after us, yeah. right? So we, yeah. we we were driving I know. around. We were just well, there. So there. If yeah, you look, figure it out. If you got to look at the statistics of accidents, happened they go through friends. the roof when a 16 year old is with another 16 year old or group of friends in a car. Now mm -hmm. let's remember back when we were kids. No, I well, ninety nine point yeah. nine percent like of the crazy shit. Chicken I did. and yeah, now do you know how much? So I agree with that. Like I don't. I mean, some of the dumbest things I've done in a car were between sixteen and eighteen with your friends with in the my car. friends, almost never in the car 100%. or racing another car, like doing yes. shit like that. So do you, do we have any idea on how how has it impacted? Has yeah, it did reduce. It? Oh, it did. Yeah, it did reduce uh, uh, it would, accidents yeah. and deaths and stuff like that. And, and it makes sense. I mean, you're, you know, you're, you're, I, I honestly, you know, just not to go off topic, I think in the future when self driving cars are like everywhere, they're going to talk about how crazy it was that we drove these big ass <laughs> metal machines all the time. <laughs> it like risked our lives every day. Them. Yeah. Like our great, yeah. our great grandkids would be like, could you, you guys yeah. drove yourself and you could crash so at any time? Dangerous. This is crazy. But anyway, he, he's, he's driving and I'm already a little nervous, but I'm like, okay, you know, I remember when I did that and he's, my, my son's very, very good. He pays attention. He follows the rules. He's not like I was when I was a kid, I was, I was reckless. Right. So I'm like, okay, he goes for the first day he drove himself to school. Now his school he requires, he takes the freeway and it's busy or whatever. Of course, first day he drives to school, he's turning out and a car is literally driving on the wrong side of the road. Oh, are you serious? What? Right at him. Right at him. He swerves and misses the car by a little bit. Then on the way home, the light turns green. And I taught him. I said, when the light turns green. Wait a second. Wait a second and look. Make sure nobody's running a red light. He did. Sure enough, car red. So he gets home. Wow. And he's exhausted. <laughs> he's like so wiped out. So it's a war zone out there, Dad? Yeah, and I called him. He's like, it wasn't a good a good first day. You know, and I'm like, what happened? He tells me about it. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, well, how do you feel about driving tomorrow? He goes, how do you think? So, like, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, man. I told him, I said, listen. He's going to drive like an old lady out there. Just, yeah. I'm like, listen. I'm like, a little bit of beer will calm you down. No, I'm just kidding. I said, listen. <laughs> when you're driving, I said, it's a good thing that you pay attention. Because the reason why you you didn't get hit was because you were paying attention. So you know, I was that. lucky. I, defensive driving. I grew up in a very small town, so probably a really good place to, because I can't imagine being a kid in the city like this. There's, it's stressful driving. I mean, I, to this day, when I go to San Francisco, I get a little stressed out when I drive. Yeah. There's so many one way streets and lights are like yeah. time so quick. People walking across the yeah, middle of the road, yeah, like pedestrians are all. Yeah, place. there's you know a lot of like bikes and motorcycles going by you. Like that, I didn't grow up with that. So I was my my parents taught me how to drive when I was 14, and we lived out in the country, right? And I learned how to drive on a stick. And I re vividly remember when you're first learning how to drive a stick. Like the, the clutch and the shifting part is so difficult that I would shift and I'd like look down and I'd, already, I'd be drifting in the other lane, <laughs> you know? But we're in the country. watching your feet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was just a habit. Like every time I shift, I'd do this kind of thing and then I look oh, back man. up and I'm like in the other lane and then I have to go back. <laughs> and, but I mean, we live in the country, so there would be no car for Bro, you know, we had, 20 minutes. You I know? Drove, we drove stick, yeah. stick shift. We had, so in other words, I, I told my son this too when I was talking about stick, I was talking about it. And he's like, I don't ever see a stick shift car anymore. I said, Yeah, but that's what I learned on. Yeah. And I said, You know how you know how fun it was? And I meant I didn't mean it, it literally, I meant sarcastically. When you're when you have to stop going uphill yeah, at a red dude. light oh, and yeah. you got stick shift and then you gotta take off. I said, you know what that's like? I said, you have to learn how to use the e-brake at first, but oh, then you figure dude. it out how to do the whole thing. But I drove stick shift, the the wind the windows were manual. So it's like you push a button, you had to uh, 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 mm -hmm. do this thing. There's no rear view, view, rear view camera. Yeah. There's no airbags. Yeah. Uh, it's like a death trap. The yeah. cars that we drove were death trap. I drove the first car I drove was a, a Dodge Colt. It was like a 1986. I think I don't know, it was a piece of crap. Tank. Yeah. And no, it wasn't even. It was just a, It was like a tin can. <laughs> and the and one of the first things I did when I got my license was drive to Santa Cruz. I'm like, oh cool, I'm gonna go to the, the boardwalk. Oh, 17. Yeah. I'm yeah. driving over 17, and I could not go faster than 48 miles an hour because the car was so underpowered. I hit the hit the you know the hill. Yeah. And I'm like. Wing! <laughs> I had to turn the AC off so that the car could. Oh, drive. Yeah. So are so you uh, okay? So now he's. Are you getting him a car? What's going to be? He's got a car. 
Oh, he already has a car. His uncle gave him a car. Just straight up gave him a car? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's got 170,000 miles on it, but it's a good car. It's a, it was, uh, what was it, the IS300 Lexus, but it's an old one, but it yeah. drives good and it's, you know, yeah, it's yeah. maintained. But yeah, his uncle gave it to him, which is really cool. That's cool. Yeah, and it's a safe car and all that stuff. Now, how, okay, so how do you? Because obviously, the uncle probably—I mean, do you think the uncle's going to give every kid a car now? Or no. Like, so I, I was in this situation, by the way. Like I had to return. My grandmother bought me my first car, or my my first car. I drove an '84 Camry first. But I've told this story a long. If you listen to Mind Pump a long time ago, I think I shared the story where I was arrested and my parents made me return the car and all that. Yeah. So you guys know that yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that the. The, the my my parents' logic by why I couldn't have the car was because, you know, they didn't think my grandmother was going to buy it for every sibling. So mm. I, I, why do I get it? Because you're the firstborn, bro. Well, I was. You get all the responsibility, but you got to get some glory too, man. Come I on. mean, I that's how I felt as a yeah. kid. Because you were, was, they were raising your siblings But they too, were man. like, nah, either one, I get to live at the house and I get no car or I have to live in my car. That was my options. So you lived in the car? I did. I mean, I was, <laughs> yeah. Of course, as a 16-year-old boy who just got a brand new car, you bet your ass that was like exactly what I did. You mean I could go to bed whenever I, I was wanted? Like, yeah, I was <laughs> packing my bags 15 minutes later, you know? So, But eventually, they actually called me in as a runaway, and I still got arrested and brought back. Well, now, I, so what were your? So what was the car? What were the cars that you had when you first started? So I had the Dodge <laughs> Colt. It was gold. It was actually the model that had the little <laughs> stick that went from economy to power, which yeah. really just meant slow and not as slow. It was still slow. So I had that. Then the second car was actually the first car I bought because I worked since I was 14. I had saved up a bunch of cash. My dad and I went to the Toyota dealership mm -hmm. and bought a, and I financed a brand new Toyota pickup truck, four cylinder, base as fuck, no AC, no power steering, nothing, $10,000 out the door. And I financed it. And then I ended up paying it off like a year later. That was the second car. And then the third car I got was a Volkswagen GTI, which was the first like mm. better car that I had. That was it. What were your guys' first? No, I had uh, it was like a '80s, 1980s, like uh, Honda Civic, brown piece of shit. You know, uh, manual stick shift. The back, you know, the the headliner stuff was all coming down, dude. Like <laughs> it was brutal. Uh, and then I had a Toyota Tercel, and these are all like I had paid, you know a grand or two for these cars that I worked all summer to just buy these pieces of shit. And then, uh, my third one was like one, I actually worked like all summer and tried to grind my way to buy this, um, old classic, um, GMC pickup as a 1956 GMC pickup that had a 400 Pontiac big block in it and literally had no safety like like the suspension was dog shit like it, it like i would drive it and it would sound like bolts were like falling on the ground <laughs> and i would because it had so much power and torque i would just burn out and, and how old were you i was i was probably 17 i, I was oh yeah I was 17 and We're looking to be here, right now, dude. I I was <laughs> racing fools. Like I was like, it stuff was. I would pull over. I didn't have a gas gauge, and so I would like run out of gas, like in the middle of a uh, uh, you know intersection, and then just push it, it dude. It was just <laughs> nuts. I can't believe my parents let me just like go out in public with that thing. <laughs> it's hilarious, but it was yeah. badass. I, I just looked it up. I thought it was an eighty four. It was an, it was an eighty seven. So nineteen eighty seven. Oh, you're spoiled. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a 1987 Toyota Camry. It was turd brown. Uh, so this is like what 90? This is like 97. Yes, when, 10 so, years old. Yeah, so it's a 10 year old. Yeah, what happened to all the turd brown uh, colors? Right, that, that was like style, a thing huh? back then, yeah. right? And so this thing, this thing. Let me tell you how how fucked up this thing was. Okay, so the trunk. My my parents had locked the keys in the trunk one time, and so my 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 stepdad drilled the the lock yeah. drilled literally took a drill and drilled it out so it was like you couldn't lock the trunk anymore and had like a hole was in there it right a there. wire <laughs> you just pulled open <laughs> yeah it. dude it was it was all you couldn't even open it you could only open it from the inside <laughs> pop it open right that's the only way you can get in inside the trunk the left uh, tail light was uh broken because someone had backed into a grocery cart all four tires were different wheels and tires, so none of them matched or had hubcaps <laughs> on them. Uh, the the top was completely like sun bleached, you know, when you left the car yeah. out yeah, forever, yeah. so it was completely you sun bleached. Had spots on mine too. In the winter time, somebody accidentally left the windows unrolled, so it had just got soaked with rain inside, so it smelt of mildew. Nice. The, the it was a stick. It would fall out of second gear randomly when you're driving. So you'd be driving, and it would just pop out of second gear. Boom! To be in neutral, and you had to shift it back in. 
again. This thing was just an, an absolute piece of shit car. And that's what I started driving. Now, when I had my license, I also used to go to, I used to, I've told the story, I used to milk the cows before I would go to school early in the morning, like four o'clock in the morning. Um, and the reason why my grandmother took me to get a car was one day I came home late or from school. Like I was supposed to come directly home from school. I don't even, to be honest with you, I don't remember. I was probably playing basketball and messing with my friends and I didn't come directly home. I was supposed to, my parents were pissed and I was grounded. But when they grounded me, they grounded me from the car. That's it. You don't get your car. And we could walk to school. So that wasn't that big of a deal. But I went to, I went to work and the deal was I don't even get to use it for work. Now, I worked like seven miles away out in the country at four o'clock in the morning. And so I had to ride my bike to work at three o'clock in the morning. What kind of bike did you, was it? Oh, it was just some piece of shit, 10 speed bike. I don't know. <laughs> I don't even know what it you was. You had to ride your bike at like 3.30 in the morning. So I was doing this. So I was grounded for several weeks. I'm about a week into this and <clears throat> I'm on my way to work at like three something in the morning and uh, the chain breaks oh. halfway there. 3.30 in the morning, you know, or four o'clock in the morning or so on your way to work uh, and the chain breaks. And I remember I just broke down crying because I'm out in the middle of nowhere. No cell phone. I, well, yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't, I actually was, I don't remember how I got a hold of my girlfriend, but my, I called my girlfriend who woke her mom up and the two of them came and picked me up and, and took me to work. But I called my grandmother like crying on the phone like later on, the, later on that day and just was telling her, I said, listen, I, my, my parents, you take the car away from me anytime I screw up or do anything. And I said, I need to get to work at least. And I said, I have a thousand dollars that I've saved up from all the work I'm doing. Would you come down and co-sign for me so I can get a car that's mine that they can't take from yeah. me. And at that point, that's my knowledge of the law. I don't realize that if you're under 18, like nothing is yours. Yeah. So I didn't learn that till later. So she came down that weekend. She was pissed. She, was, she couldn't believe that my parents would, take that away from work. They understandable ground him from school, sure. driving to school, whatever that, but to, to do that to him going to work. And so she came down and the, I was going thinking I was going to get a used S 10, uh, Chevy pickup, like a little banger that probably had 80,000 miles on it. Cause that was all I could probably afford. What'd she do? She over, over, over correct. She did. She bought me a brand new Acura Integra, which was like, oh, that was a sick car back in the very sick car. Yeah. I was like, that was like my dream was car. It the same one you had. That yeah. You I had that car. I yes. Wait a minute. Was it type S? No, it wasn't oh, a type yeah, S. It was an it was an LS, uh, um, but it was really nice, right? It was really really nice for me. I mean, that was in the, in the late nineties. Like that was one of the that was the cool car. Oh, it was a very cool yeah. car. It was like my dream car as a kid. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, my knowledge of cars at that point that was the, kind of the extent of it. You know, yeah. it was uh, recently. I think not long after that. Uh, Fast so and she, Furious little, she went a little too far. Into the oh yeah, I mean that now that gets into my mom and my my grandmother's issues that they have. That was kind of like her sticking it to her probably. And of course, as a teenage boy, grandmother says, "We're gonna go get you this brand new car. I got you." Like, like, what do you do? <laughs> yeah. Like, hell yes, right? So yeah. I drove it home, and best. my parents just looked at it, shook my head, and said, nah, take it back. And I'm like, hell no, I'm not taking it back. It's mine. You know, I'm like, taking it back. They said, nah, you either, you either take it back or you don't live here. I said, okay, I packed my bags. I packed my bags. I had the car for about two weeks, and then uh, I found out through my friend's mom that my parents had called the cops on me and said that I was a runaway. So I went down to the police station, uh, being proactive, like I'm not gonna get arrested, right? For for runaway, I'm not a runaway. I said they threw me out of the house. They gave me an ultimatum. I left, and they said it doesn't matter. They call you in as a runaway. You're under 18. You're a ru you're a runaway. And I'm like, no, this is what they said. And I said, well, what do I do? I'm like, well, you have to go back home. Said, That's my only option. Well, that or you get emancipated. So I said, what do I? I need to sign. You know, so I literally wrote up like you know them s s turning over my uh, you know guardianship yeah. over to my grandmother. And brought it home for them to sign, and that was like that was when they my stepfather stood in the way, so I couldn't leave. And then he tackled me, and they called the cops, and I was arrested. It's a whole other story. Oh but man! I, yeah, I ended up having to. My grandma had to take the car back down to San Jose, where she lived. I lived in the valley, and parked it in her garage, uh, and it was going to be parked there indefinitely until I turned eighteen years old. Uh, luckily, my parents saw that. I probably was never going to speak to them again after, because it was like six months of like silence from me. Like I literally went on, I was so angry and hurt that like I spent the next six months like not speaking at dinner, like just doing what I was told, getting my grades, like I'm like, and literally telling them like, when I turn 18, you're never going to see me again. And I think they really felt that was going to happen because I definitely meant it when I said it back then. 
And then as I got to be about 17, I want to say 17, 17 and a half, they started, they gave me like this, oh, if you get a 3.5 or whatever, we'll let you have the car back. So of course I got the grades and- Wow. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah, well, yeah. I guess yours is the worst. <laughs> <laughs> Doug, what, your first car was a woolly mammoth, right? <laughs> yes, of course. Horse and yeah, carriage. <laughs> yeah, it was a chariot. It was not a horse and carriage. What was your no, first car? No, it was a Honda Civic. Oh, hatchback. Wow. Yep. Oh, there you go. In a manual, you know. Yeah. So I, I learned on a Ford Maverick, oh. which was a three on the tree, they called it. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Which was a bear to shift. <clears throat> oh, man. You know, those Civics, those hatchback Civics had incredible gas mileage. You know that? Yeah, they did. Even today, if you have like an early 80s like hatchback Civic, they will put a lot of cars to shame. That but now they now of course they you know they're they're terrible horsepower and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. And they're but like they a weren't can. Yeah, <laughs> no guts at all. No, nothing at all. But the 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 gas mileage on those cars was just absolutely insane. Yeah, yeah. So we all basically learned stick first. Yeah. yeah. Oh wow, well, everybody yeah. did, huh? Yeah, because I I took it to this lumber yard and like whenever it rained, that was like my dad's way of getting me prepared was like to have me just hydroplane as oh, much wow. as possible. And so every time I went down, we'd go down there and like do donuts and like slide. Learn how to control the car. And, yeah, That's control smart. The car. Got really comfortable and like calm. Is it all about being calm? You know, just small corrections. Dude, I, I you know, telling my kids how it was when we were kids, they, their minds are blown. I'm like, you know, when we used to go places with my parents and family was over and my parents would have a small car. They didn't have make much money. We sat like we two or three kids would sit on each other's laps in the back seat. Mom would hold the baby in <laughs> so the front. Crazy, dude. There was no car seat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Nobody so gave a crazy, shit. You know, yeah. it was insane. You know, yeah. it, or in in the back of a pickup. You know how how many times? <clears throat> oh. I was in the back of a pickup with a bunch of friends while another friend is driving. There's yeah. no seat. You're Bro. just in the back of a truck. We used to do that. Like we'd go up like to Lake Almanor, and it was like you know six hours from here or something. And and I'd be in the back of the pickup, and the gas tank was right there and literally <laughs> was it was this explains gas a lot. fumes for hours uh, dude. now i see <laughs> <laughs> and here i thought it was cte no, <laughs> no it's a gas fume it's a, when i when i would go to work with my dad and his work van which was it was this old ass work van or whatever he had this this wood like box in the middle in between the passenger and the driver's seat because that's where he would put some of his tools and stuff and he, that's where I would sit. I'd sit on this wood box like, while we a, drive a to rope work. As a seat no, <laughs> or a no it was when I told my dad. So he had to hit the brakes once, and I fucking hit. The, my dad had to grab me because I almost went through the front, you know, windshield. So the next day, my dad made a seatbelt. It was a rope. It was a, a rope <laughs> tied bolted across. on one side. Yeah, and then I just hook it around the other side. And that's what I would. <laughs> <We're> just <laughs> fine. Yeah. Just, You're gonna be just. Fine. Hey, I turned builds out, I turned character. Out okay. Builds yeah. character. Yeah. 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 You know, yeah. The weak yeah. ones died. That's all I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> ones that were left over were strong. We did. Okay. Yeah. Dude. Anyway, dude, I got to tell you guys about um, a thing that I added uh, to the sleep routine that it's only been a few days, but holy shit. What are you doing? So, okay. So as of right now, the sleep routine, well, as of before, the sleep routine would consist of about a couple hours before bed. Either we turn dim off the lights. Yeah. Dim the lights. Put your Felix rays on. I put my Felix rays on. Yeah, that always yeah. makes a huge difference. If I don't, if I forget to put on my blue blockers. A little um, Yanni in the background. Yeah. No, I don't do that. <laughs> <No>. yeah, <laughs> Yanni's a good time. We should post a picture of Yanni right now. Do yeah. you know I went to? That was the first concert I he went to. like Taylor, Really? Ironically. First concert I went to was Yanni. Oingo Boingo for me. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oingo wow. Boingo? Really? Yeah. That's better than Yanni. Wow. <laughs> Random, I was listening right? to the guy just go riff on a keyboard. You know, and I'm a killer. What the hell am I that's watching? Right. I went to like a Christian punk band, so that's a little different. That's all right. That's cool. That's I guess. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> kind of not really. <laughs> hey, cooler than Yanni, bro. There's, yeah. no, there's no words. It's yeah. all keyboard shit. It's definitely cooler than Yanni. Yeah. That's for sure. Yeah. Anyway, so I, I, you know, uh, the blue blockers dim the lights. You know, I don't eat a couple hours before bed, and this makes a big difference, especially if I remember to dim the lights or put on the the Felix Grays. Well, anyway, uh, working with MPHormones.com, right? So they they're the ones that do my TRT. But they also have peptides. They don't work with SARMs. That would be stupid because you have testosterone there. But they do work with peptides, and this is all doctor. You know, um, they're, they're watching everything with like it. Like BBC one fifty seven stuff like that. Yes. Okay. So, I didn't know this. Yes. So they do. They work with all the peptides, right? So there's a peptide called abutamorin, which I, I don't remember what the actual, like the chemical name. I think it's MK six seven seven or something weird like that. But abutamorin is what they call it, and what it does is it releases growth hormone. It's oral, so you don't inject anything. You take it before bed, 
And then you get this spike of growth hormone that lasts and it's not growth hormone itself. It just causes your body to release more growth hormone. And it's proven in studies to do so. What? Uh, yeah. And it's, you know, from re reading reviews, yeah, it is MK677 is the, is the I guess, the chemical name Sounds or whatever. Sounds like a robot. Man. I know. I always have weird names. But anyway, um, <clears throat> you take it, you get these results from growth hormone, which, you know, could be like better recovery, skin, maybe a little bit of fat loss, muscle building, that kind of stuff. So I'm like, well, it's doctor. He's, uh, you know, re recommending it or suggesting it. They're watching me, which is cool. So I can see, you know, what's happening. So let me give this a shot, right? So I tried it now for three days. And that with the sleep routine, oh, bro, I haven't slept like this since I was, I don't know, a kid. Mm. Like hard. Remember when you were a kid and you sleep so hard? That you feel like you went through a time warp, like you close your eyes and you wake up, like oh my god, it's already in the morning, really? and have like vivid dreams throughout the night. That's mm. what's happening right now. So it's I, really I mean, wild. I, I I've taken growth hormone before. It's been a long time since I have, but one, actual growth hormone. Yeah, act, like actual you know growth hormone. And one of the things that I liked the best about it was the sleep. I would just get the most restful sleep, and I would wake up and it refreshed. Re yeah, it reminded me of waking up as a teenage kid. Like you know, when you're a teenage kid, I felt like no matter how much sleep I got or how it was, it was like I popped out of bed and I was like yeah. ready to go for the day, yeah. full of energy, was never groggy or slow. Um, it felt like that on it. it was one of the things that I noticed. Now, are you seeing any? So it's probably too early for three this. Days. Okay, it's probably too early for this. I'm going to be really interested to hear if you. One of the other things I remember noticing as a side effect. It's not really a bad thing, but it, um, my fingernails. <laughs> Would grow. Yeah. I was having to trim my fingernails like yeah. every week yeah. because they grew so fast. Yeah, so you should. I, sh I guess I should notice, right? Nails and skin. Yeah, and skin tissue. was the other thing I noticed. My skin was like really, really. But I would, I would imagine that would take me at least a few months. Yeah, it took like right? at least three to six months for me to like really notice those things. It was very minimal. Yeah. Like you, I, I thought from back then when I took it, um, you know, the hype around it, like you, you know, all the biggest bodybuilders were taking it, and so I thought it, it had a a big part in like just building tons of muscle it doesn't feel like that at all yeah. it, like you don't even feel it. it's not like testosterone where you take it and you feel like the growth hormone you just yeah. feel good yeah and yeah. you consistently feel well good. i mean it's only and, been a few days and the sleep is just incredible but it's cool because they go they do work with peptides now technically you can buy peptides over the counter but it's not regulated that way they're sold as research chemicals online you don't know what you're getting could be fake you don't have anybody monitoring your blood, so you know what's going on. With in this particular case, you know obviously they're monitoring things. It's with the doctor, and it's a legit source. So that's why I'm like, yeah, I'll give it a shot. Yeah. And it's man, I I so can you tell. take it like an hour before right before bed sleep. or just right before right bed. before him. empty stomach. Yeah, empty stomach right before bed. I just take it and then go to sleep. And now would something like this pop up for like an athlete? Like if an athlete was that's a great question. Like with because I would imagine there's huge benefits for athletes to be taking that things a really like this. Really good question. I wonder if it's. I'm, I would assume it's banned, but how would you test for right. it? Right. If it's just if it if it naturally just kind of boosted boost the growth. And I remember. I remember. I, 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 I. It's probably not so crazy where it's like your you know your forehead and skull is going to grow like no no no. Bombs, I, right. <laughs> I've, what I've heard it compared to is like taking one IU or one and a half IUs of, of growth hormone a day, which is oh, not sorry, bodybuilder that. dose, not- So your head's not going to grow. No, it is. I it's can't a, imagine your head getting any bigger. No, I don't have a- Yeah, that's just figurative though. Literally, <laughs> forehead. I don't have the biggest head. Uh, it is a prohibited substance. Oh, so it is. There you go. Yeah, uh, so it's a- it's, Banned. Yeah, so it's a pet Banned. Kind of yeah. Well, hey- Sorry, athletes. That means it works. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's yeah, all yeah. I can say. Is, I, didn't, I didn't know that they, they offered that. Is yeah, it, they have all- they, they work with- like all the peptides besides SARMs, because SARM, again, why would you use a SARM when you have actual testosterone? Well, we got to get them to talk more about peptides in that uh, forum. I think it's really cool, right? Yeah. Yeah, very, very interesting. I didn't know they offered that either. Yeah, very interesting. Well, I remember when we took, we all took the BP BPC-157. Am yeah. I saying that right? Yeah. We all took that uh, a, a long time ago, and it was right after I did my Achilles. And I remember while I was taking it, I felt a huge difference mm. in it. Now, the one thing I did notice was... If as soon as I stopped taking it, I didn't get that same that same feeling. Like it didn't feel like, and it was, that's different. That's not a growth hormone releasing peptide. That's yeah, something different. It's a different type of. Pe it's a peptide. Though, yes, right? yes, so, yes, yes. And that one was injecting. Yeah, you used I did, like a yeah it was sub Q pill. or whatever. Yeah, I'd, I'd actually like shoot it in the Achilles. You're supposed to shoot it in the area where you have the injury injury, and it was supposed to speed up the process of the the tissue rebuilding, if yeah. I remember correctly. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. 
and it felt it felt better when I was taking it. But I did notice that if I wasn't taking it, I didn't I didn't feel the same. Wow. Well, speaking of uh, of partners and stuff, um, now that we're working again with Seed. And are you guys using the probiotic that they have? I've, I've been some home. Yeah, I'm getting consistent with it right now. We had that little stint where we just took off to Florida, so I, I did fall so off. Have you noticed a difference between this and any of the other probiotics? So I, I I can't say that I have yet, only because I don't feel like I've been consistent enough to judge it. So just being completely honest and transparent to the audience, like I do remember though in the past taking seed and we uh, we all loved it. I mm -hmm. thought it was amazing, um, but I haven't been consistent again with it to see if I can start to notice some things. Well, I'm, my gut. Has Health never been better. Now it's not be entirely because of that. It was already a lot better from some other stuff that I did. Yeah. This was like the icing on the cake, and I and I I'm pretty sure the difference is their delivery process. Because remember when we interviewed the founder? Mm -hmm. Yeah, was, yeah. I did not know this. That was that like a fascinating interview. Yeah, that like thirty percent of of most probiotic or, or probiotics, most probiotics, thirty percent of it only makes its way into the gut. Is it is into it, the my, colon? Oh, is yeah. So it? this the 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 capsule itself was created so that it doesn't release anything until it gets where it's supposed to. And they use this very sophisticated machine that simulates the gut and the small intestines and the large intestines and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the big difference. Because I use probiotics on and off all the time. Yeah. yeah. And this one is totally... And I remember, too, when we were working with them Oh, uh, well, I'm definitely dealing with all kinds of issues uh, right now, and it's like feels like it's overgrowth, so I'm going to have to address that. But oh, yeah, you're getting you like... Got, you got tummy stuff going on? Yeah, yeah, it's been really annoying, dude. It's been the past like month. It's really like um, accelerated, so I got to With all the good stuff going down. on in our lives, you're feeling this? What's going on? Yeah, what's happening? Yeah, oh, yeah. it's... it's uh, I like to self-sabotage. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I think... It's going too good. You might have... You need to get tested for CB. Yeah. See what's going on. Yeah. It Katrina, sounds like Katrina's family would say you're C3PO. harboring something. Or something. Just harboring. Yeah, harbors yeah, everything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what do you mean? Just push it down there. And yeah. <laughs> and hope and it, there. it leaks out. You know, yeah. I don't know. You cut them open, man. Shoot yeah. Them. Not, Come not, <laughs> don't, I'm trying to cry about don't it. Don't mess with that. Yeah. Anyway, so I was having a conversation with, um, so there's a lot of babies, new babies in my family. So obviously Jessica, you know, we had uh, our son uh, 15 or 16 months ago. My cousin, um, Alex, just had a daughter a few months ago. My brother just had a baby a year ago. My other cousin, Gabriel, just had a baby. And so we were all together. I told you guys for my, my brother's son's baptism. It was really cool. And I'm talking to the wives, and everybody's looking great, and everybody's healthy and all that stuff. And you know, we had this conversation about like how your body is affected through pregnancy and then post-pregnancy and what you deal with. And you know, I tell you what. It's now standard practice to have physical therapy after surgery or after an injury. I think nobody will argue that after surgery, after an injury, when you heal, physical therapy makes a tremendous difference. We know this, and it's again, it's standard practice. Go yeah. get surgery, and they will get, send you to a, a PT afterwards, right? Yeah, no brainer. What is not standard practice, what needs to be standard practice, is physical therapy postpartum. I agree. Mm. You Now, as a trainer... I trained lots and lots of women postpartum once they had got clearance, and it was like we were backtracking and fixing a lot of issues because they didn't do anything for for you know however long it took for them to get clearance, right. and there were lots of correctional things I had to do. This needs to be standard care. Like after having a baby, you need to go to physical therapy. The challenge is, and again, talking with the 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 women, they're like, here's a problem. I. I'm not, I have a newborn. I'm not going to a clinic mm, and work, yeah. which then of course I told them about Luna and I'm like, they will send a PT to your door. I could see this being such a, Oh, it makes so much sense. Such a huge market. So underserved and such, so needed. Right? I didn't even oh, think, I didn't think about, reconnect. I, I didn't even think about that, that that's probably the biggest hurdle when you just had a baby is being, that's able why to, yeah, that makes think about sense. the pelvic floor issues yes. that are so common. Your TVA, TVA is turned yeah, off. Access, your yep. core stability is fucked. You're, you're in this hunched over position, breastfeeding and trying to do things. So your lower back is just like inflamed Dude, all the time. Do you think that, do you, what's your theory on why that that isn't a standard practice that we just automatically after you think that's, that's why? Oh, Be you think so? Yeah, 100% because you're not going to have a new mom go, even, even after they get clearance, how long does it typically take? Uh, nine weeks or six weeks, something like that, before they can start doing some kinds of yeah, activity? Yeah. I can't remember. Six weeks. Something like that, right? Yeah. Fine, you have a six week old. You're gonna go to an appointment with a PT. Yeah, no. With your six week old baby, you're wow. not gonna do that. I wonder if that's the reason why. That's I, I, it's got to be because uh, you know, women typically don't seek out exercise or instruction for like a year. When I would get clients, it was like yeah, yeah, six months to a year. 
it was never six weeks. Nobody ever would leave for that long with an appointment. What unless an, they were wealthy what an interesting and they could thought. I wonder if that's going to happen or not. I, it should, because at least in, with Luna, because they send the physical therapist to your house, now you have a mother who gets clearance postpartum. The baby is still there. You get yeah. an experienced PT who comes in and can do these movements and exercises with you, help you recover and feel better. Well, like you said, I mean, it's standard practice after a major surgery to have the follow-up with physical therapy. And so, like, that's basically, like, the, the same scenario. Like, your body's healing after this, you know, traumatic experience. I, I wonder if they're marketing in that direction. I mean, I feel like that's low-hanging fruit for them to go after that because nobody is able to serve that market. They did say that this is, that's one area. Oh, they they're did. They're starting to see some growth. The challenge is because they're growing so fast is that their demand is like they got to meet the, the demand with uh -huh. the supply. But they are. They're, they're really driving. I mean, we already talked about how this company is going to revolutionize that whole space. Yeah. But I, that and elder physical therapy, you know, you try like my grandparents, they need physical therapy. My grandfather's gait is off, his balance. He needs strength. My grandmother's in a walker now. You're, they don't want to leave the house. Like just getting them to go to my, you know, from my aunt's house to my mom's house, which is down the street, is now becoming like an argument or a pain in the butt. Getting them to go to a physical therapist appointment twice a week, like, so they want someone to come to the house, and and more often than not, they will send someone to the house because they've been doing that for a while. But it's still not as accepted, right? Still not like that standard care. So I I, I see that also being a huge part of the market. Wow. Hey, real quick, do you like soda? Of course you do. It's delicious. The only problem is it's full of sugar and it's bad for your health. Not Olipop. Olipop is soda, or it tastes like soda, except super low calories, very low in sugar. It's got fiber in it, and it's got compounds that are good for your gut health. I'm not making this up. It's a soda that's good for your gut health and is very low in calorie. Olipop, you got to check them out. Great product. Go to mindpumppartners.com. Click on Olipop. Use the code MINDPUMP for a discount. All right, here comes the rest of the show. Our first caller is Marie from California. Hey Marie, how can we help you? Hi, I just had a, a silly question actually. So I've been prepping, I have eight weeks until my next show and my coach wants me on the Stairmaster, which I'll do, but I absolutely loathe the Stairmaster. Like I will try everything but that first. And so I'm wondering what the significance of the Stairmaster versus incline walking at a fast pace, like a 3.5 on a 10 incline. Um, what's the significance between the two? What's the prominence of the Stairmaster versus the incline walk? Those kinds of things. Yeah, good question. First off, why do you think it's a silly question? <laughs> yeah, no, it's a good question. Um, because some people really like the Stairmaster and I absolutely hate it. And your, yeah. co your coach yeah. is not going to like me when it, I get a hold of this well, question. So well, <laughs> just so you know. Here's the most I tried to get out of it. Let's here's, put it that way. Here's the, <laughs> good. Yeah. Here's the most significant difference between the two, okay? You hate one and you don't hate the other one. Yeah. I mean, that's the truth now. Now, yeah. is one going to burn more calories than the other one? Yeah, I mean, uh, Stairmasters tend to burn more calories than walking fast on an uphill it's not a huge difference you could easily make it up, make up for it with a calorie reduction or maybe a faster pace honestly i don't understand why coaches are so weird about specific cardio applications and i almost feel like their goal is to make it as miserable as possible yeah. like they get off <laughs> on really hammering people and making them do stuff that they don't want to do but no, there's not a, I mean, not a huge, I mean, you might burn a little more calories, I guess, but it's not a, such a big difference that it's going to make well, I mean, all she'll, the difference in the world. She'll burn more if, if it's, if she, all she does is walk incline most of the time and she never does Stairmaster, there's value in that because of the novelty of it, right? Just because it is different. So it's not mm -hmm. just, it's not just purely getting your heart rate up. It's, it's a different uh, modality. So the fact that it's new and different, that's part of why you probably hate it. You don't like it. And there is some benefit to that, but that's not what I want to address because you, you wrote your question and I can actually see it right now. And there's a mm -hmm. part that you left out that your coach is not going to like me addressing right now. But I, this is this is also how I made my bones in the space because so many coaches did this and it just didn't make sense to me. Tell me what he or she had you doing the during the bulking phase. Were you doing cardio during the bulking phase? I was. It wasn't as much. It was about 30 minutes, four to five times a week. Um, not very, not very uh, intense and no hit. And now I have some hit in conjunction with incline walk and or stairs. And so um, I'm not doing, we're not bulking anymore, 
But I think one of the reasons why I hate the stairs so much is um, I exert way more energy, almost like an asthmatic effect. Like I just can't stay on there very long. My endurance on the stairs is miserable compared to the incline walk. I don't know if there's a difference in that. Well, there's so this is part of the benefits of it, though, too. Right. So. Mm-hmm. You're, you've probably become very adapted to walking incline that your body's become very efficient at it. Therefore, it's not mm-hmm. going to burn as much energy as it would if you were on the Stairmaster. So there's the really, the only, now there's some people that love the Stairmaster. They do it all the time. And then I would mm-hmm. tell them to go do the elliptical, the bike or something else because they never do that. So the thing that's, gotcha. the, the thing that's going to bring you the most benefit is the thing that you never do. Do you ever, if you never row, then go row instead. There's a lot oh, okay. of there's lots of different uh, cardio modalities that you can do to gain those benefits. But if you do the same thing all the time, consistently, weeks in, months out, years out, as far as your mode of cardio, then mm-hmm. your body's going to be most efficient at that. And when you're trying to burn more calories, burn more body fat, and you're in your case getting ready for a show, then d- doing something that you're not used to doing is going to benefit you the most for cardio. Yeah. But I, I'm, I'm not done addressing this coach because okay. it, it, this this does never make sense to me why these coaches keep cardio in the, in the routine all the time. Because mm-hmm. we would be far better off in during the bulk if you eliminated all cardio and we, yeah. we, we would only need to add enough calories so you, you could add less calories and get the same benefits bulking. I also would get the benefit of you taking off all cardio so then when I in, reintroduce your walking incline that you haven't mm-hmm. been doing for the last three to four months, your body's going to respond again. Like it's, it's a new stimulus. So it always, gotcha. it, al- it always blew my mind when these coaches during a bulking season would still have their clients doing cardio. Even, even though you're, you're saying 30 minutes for 30 minutes, four to five times a week, my, my female clients were doing that four weeks out from a show. That oh, we, wow. Yeah. And we didn't get, we didn't <laughs> start doing our cardio till the last week or two. Because yeah. we, we we adjusted our our weight true our weight routine and our calories mm-hmm. to lean you out, and I I'd rather do it that way as much as possible until we get to the final weeks it, and that, use calories. That's exactly what I was going to say because mm-hmm. uh, you're especially intense cardio while you're dieting. I'm sure your calories are really low while you're doing a lot of resistance training. You're you're, you're you may be sacrificing muscle um, because mm-hmm. of this adaptation signal. Um, I, I, I don't get it. I think, again, I say it's trivial because the difference, because, because you can make up for it with cal- caloric, you know, restriction or dropping calories a little bit. And, mm-hmm. or you might even have a faster metabolism by not doing so much intense cardio on top of your intense resistance training that's on top right. of a calorie deficit. This is, that's why I made that comment. I feel like coaches mm-hmm. are like, let's see how much we can beat this person up. Because yeah. and I, I just don't I just don't understand it. It's really not a scientific approach. Uh, so it's uh, not at all. It's it's the mm-hmm. the formula for most of these coaches. This, again, this is uh, I did not get into that space with the intent of becoming a coach. I just mm-hmm. saw I had so many people coming up to me and asking for help. And when I would assess what their coaches were telling them, I thought this is so ridiculous. Like you have to understand that when you're in a cut, like Sal was saying, you're you're restricting calories already. And then if you go add intense cardio. The signal mm-hmm. you're sending to the body is not one to keep muscle. And that's yeah. part, of, part of the goal of us bulking together. So if I just bulked you for you know two months or three months before we get ready for our stage and get ready for mm-hmm. our cut, obviously the goal is to hang on to as much of that muscle you and I worked for building as possible. Mm-hmm. So that for me, that means I want to I want to minimize how much intense cardio I do with you. I only want to do it in those last few weeks as a like kind of an emergency. Like, okay, okay, we're getting ready. We, we were almost ready for stage. You're not quite as lean as I want you to. Okay, let's ramp this cardio up, knowing that I'm probably going to lose a little bit of muscle along the way too, because mm-hmm. I know I've got you in a calorie deficit and I'm pushing the shit out of your body and cardio. You start doing that six, eight, 10, 12 weeks out before the show. And of mm-hmm. course your body's going to pare down muscle and you're going to slow down the metabolism and this is going to be a fucking grind for the last 4 weeks. Yeah. What are your ca- what are your calories at um right now uh, before you show? <laughs> okay, so right now I'm at 1640. Um I have 40 grams of fat a day um and then the rest is is split between the protein and the carbs. But my last last show last year around this time the coach I was using had me at 600 
calories towards the end. So I have a different coach now, um, working much better with feeding, but I'm kind of freaking out because I'm eight weeks out and I, my body's not responding. So yeah. yeah. Well, eight, okay, hold on. Eight weeks out, 1600 calories. You're doing how much cardio and how much resistance training every week? Oh gosh, I love the gym. I'm kind of addicted. I know I've listened to your show before, so I know I should take a little more time off, but it makes me happy to go. So I'm about five. Sometimes I'll still go that sixth day and just keep it lighter. Um, and it's pretty intense. My leg days are easily two and a half hours and I'm really, I'm lifting very heavy and, um, and I've got five kids. So it's taking me a lot longer to get this off my body. And then my my shoulder days, maybe an hour and a half, then some cardio, cardios, four to five days a week, about 30 minutes each time. And then on top of that, three out of those five days, I'm doing hit with the cardio. Okay. Yeah. Wow. This so, is it, What's so hard about this, sorry, Sal, I'm cutting you off there, but I, j I just want to make the point that no matter what you say or what I say, right now, it's like, it's too little too late. Yeah. I mean, uh, that when we get somebody that like yourself who asked me a question like this and we're in the middle of a cut- you know, mm -hmm. a lot of times I normally tell them, like, listen, l just ride it out with your coach. Um, mm -hmm. They're paying attention to you more than I'm paying attention to you every day. Uh, but the next time when we get mm -hmm. out, of, out of this show, there is a much better way for us to approach this prep. Sorry, Sal, for cutting you Yeah, off. no, I was just, you know, mm -hmm. I, look, if you were a family member or a friend of mine, I'd say, if you could just not do this, <laughs> you, you stop. And if you, okay, fine, if you want to finish the show, do it. Don't do mm -hmm. this again. Okay, you, you got to use a little bit of logic here. And I say that not because you're not logical, but because I know mm -hmm. there's a lot of emotion and energy behind it. So look at this mm -hmm. logically, okay? You're lifting weights for hours, five days a week. Not like a 45-minute workout, but hours yeah. and sometimes mm -hmm. over two hours. You're doing yeah. five days a week of cardio. On top of that, an additional three hit workouts. Mm -hmm. uh, you got five kids. You're doing you're, you're doing you're doing this for a decent period of time. Your calories are sixteen hundred, which tell me you're probably going to be closer to a thousand by the end of yeah. this prep. Does this seem like something that could cause long term damage to your body and your health, the likes of which you'll be paying the price for for years to come? Answer that question yourself. You don't have to give me the answer, but think about that for a second because mm -hmm. what you don't because I see this all the time, or I've seen this many times. People do this. And then afterwards, like, why, you know, I've, mm -hmm. I've been I've been trying to reverse diet for two years. Why mm -hmm. aren't my hormones going back to normal? Why mm -hmm. am I gaining weight? What happened to me? And it's like mm -hmm. it's because of what you did. So I'm not trying to scare you, but this is just the truth, okay? Mm -hmm. If you if you looked at all these numbers, all the stuff that I listed out, it's kind of crazy. Well, the truth is, even if yeah. you even if you don't do anything. Uh, long-term metabolic to yourself as far as damage like even if it's not that like maybe that doesn't happen right now but mm -hmm. at the very least you're going to have a hell of a time not allowing the body fat to come on and come on fast when you get out of this because there's no yeah. there's no way you're going to sustain that amount of activity that low of calorie for the rest of your life so the yeah. rebound effect at the bare minimum that you're going to get from this is going to be a pain in the ass so that's the part yeah. that that's the part that I am most concerned about. I mean, Sal brings up a good point too. I mean, this is the type of this, this the where we're heading right now could set you up for metabolic damage. But at the bare, I mean, that's less likely. What's more likely to happen is that you're doing five six days of an you know hour of cardio. You're cutting your calories down to twelve hundred or less. You're training mm -hmm. like crazy, and then you get down to this show weight. You let's say you look awesome. And then mm -hmm. you come out of that, and it's like there's no way you're maintaining that. You're gonna come, and then when you come back out, boy, is the is the weight gonna come on fast, and it's gonna be really tough to speed that metabolism back up. So, you're right. Sal's right. If you were a, if you were a family member of mine or someone very close to me, I would, uh -huh. I would urge you not to do the show where you're currently at, and then let's talk about what it would look like if you were to do this. I think in a in a, a healthier way, which would have been. First of all, we would have, the, before I even let you get in, by the way, when I coach uh, my clients for shows, they um, oftentimes I'd get called or, or reached out to and they'd say, hey, Adam, I want to do a show in November. Can you, mm -hmm. can I hire you to do that? I said, that's not how it works. What I'm mm -hmm. going to do, and what I would say as a coach, I said, what I'm going to do is we're going to prep you off season, which I say is the most important part of competing is the off season. And yeah. then when I feel that your metabolism is in a very healthy place, then we'll then we'll plan a show from there. 
Because what I don't mm-hmm. know is how long is it going to take me to get someone like you up to a healthier place of calories, say 2,500 calories or so a day without yeah. putting any body fat on. Bef- I, that could take us a month or two. It could take us six months to get there or longer. So a, yeah. a good coach would do that. A good coach wouldn't allow you to pick a show. A good coach would say, let's first get you in a good place or let me assess where your metabolism is now because I want mm-hmm. you to be able to eat somewhere between 2,300 on the low end, 2,700 mm-hmm. on the high end amount of calories with no cardio, just maybe strength training three, four times a week and you're not putting on body fat, but being able to maintain. If you're there, then I'm like, okay, we're in a good place place right now with no cardio, 2,700 mm-hmm. calories a day, training three to four days a week, maintaining. I have a lot of room now to manipulate calories, to add cardio, mm-hmm. to manipulate intensity in your training, to set you on a nice eight week to 10 week prep to get you ready for a show. That That is the way you want to get ready. And if you're, if you're yeah. starting prep and you're not in the mid 2000 calorie ways, calorie mm-hmm. wise, you're probably not in a good place to be cutting for a show. Yeah. That's my opinion. Sorry, sorry, it, it, we all sound so negative. No, that's okay. <laughs> oh, I was at I was at uh, 2300 just before the cut, and then that's when we dropped down um, to 1640. And so I was there, and with my last show, even though I was at about 600 calories a day close to the show, I never lost my period at all. That's good. It stayed regular. And um, I just had my hormone levels checked before starting this last prep and everything was optimal. Good. I just bringing up testosterone just a tad. Um, so I'm, I'm watching my, my levels and it seems like my body's okay. Okay. Um, I responded well. I sleep good. I mean, uh, the markers are there, it did, but I did do the cardio when I was at 2,300 calories. Yeah, you shouldn't have been. Uh, we would want to be. Yeah. Th- we would want to be able to maintain, and then also only training three, four days a week. I don't need you to be doing more yeah. than that, especially in a bulk. In a bulk, you know, we're, yeah. we're focused on building muscle, strength. I want recovery and rest, and calorie surplus is way more of an importance at that point. And then when we when we would transition. Okay, when I would transition you from that bulk of doing no cardio to now into your cut for a show, the cut doesn't start with cardio. The cut starts with me either one, adding training volume or adding more intensity or adding more days in lifting or Mm -hmm. a slight reduction in calories or a mix of both. Maybe I drop you to 2,100 calories. I let you lift in the gym an extra day or two or we increase Mm -hmm. the volume in your training one way or another that way. And then we watch Mm -hmm. and see what happens to your body. If if I did, did my job correctly... I should start to see nice change just from mm-hmm. that. And then we're going to ride that way for a couple of weeks until I see you kind of start to slow down or plateau. And then again, I'm either going to mm-hmm. want to have more days to add volume and intensity or restrict calories, or maybe I ask you to do a walk. You know, I said, now I want you to do an hour walk every day. There's a lot of things that we do, but cardio, I'm yeah. saving intense cardio till the damn near end because I know that we just came off of a bulk where I'm trying to build muscle with you. And mm-hmm. I know a, a, a calorie deficit with high intensity cardio is the perfect recipe for your body to pare down muscle. And so I want to leave that <laughs> to be the very last thing that we potentially yeah. do. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah, it's still so new, and I'm like, oh my gosh, what am I doing? Are you in our? Are you are, are, right? Uh, are Are you in our forum by chance? I don't think so. Not yet. I just listen to you pretty much every morning when I get ready. Okay, so I'm gonna have Doug add you to our our Facebook private forum. We actually have. Okay. A lot of competitors in there so a lot of people oh. that there's there's even a few girls in there that i've trained so it's a great mm-hmm. community um and i would and there's some people that have done the show themselves with no coaches just from talking to our community and getting help from all of us so oh. I, I just urge you to get in there we'll figure out things after whatever you decide to do for this show or not but going mm-hmm. forward um you know use that use that community to kind of help you through your process okay perfect that, yeah. that's great thank you so much no awesome. problem thanks for calling I, I, what percentage would you say, Adam, of people who do these shows, what percentage of them would you say do it in a relatively oh, healthy way? Very little. Yeah. Very, very. I mean, like I said, it was, um, I, I had no intentions of coaching, like none at all. It was, it was, but it was almost like I felt, I, I felt compelled to, like I felt so bad for so, especially the bikini competitors, because I feel like they, they get uh, um, abused the most in, in getting ready for shows. Yeah. It's like this. There is. There's this one. They there's this down on cardio. Yeah. Like just there's this weird starving. idea, and this is this is also prevalent in the men's space too. It's not just women that do this too. Men are guilty of this too, which always blew on. This idea of doing all this cardio 
uh, in the office. And by the way, okay, remember when we're talking about this, because you might hear me contradict myself if I'm talking to a health person or someone who wants just to be healthy, right? We're not talking, we're talking about sport right now, mm -hmm. how to maximize this, how to do it in the safest, smartest, fastest, healthiest way. There's some things that the, my rules change a little bit here. That person in a bulk, I don't want them doing any cardio. I want, why? Does it make sense for them? Now, if you're, if general health, who's somebody, that's a different situation. So yeah. the, the way these, these uh, coaches prep these, these bikini girls for shows, it just doesn't make any sense. It, it's not science based at all. It's like starve you and work you to death. Yeah. And, and then it literally what it is, is the, 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 the girl or the guy who wins the show was the one who was just could adhere to the most punishment or mm -hmm. had the, the best genetics going into yeah, they it. They had they could, the most they, resilient yes. genetics to the damage. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would even venture to say just if you, if you look at the, the whole picture, the fact that it, who it attracts. So who's attracted to a, a, a sport where you're, presenting your body on stage to get it judged. When you look at the caloric restriction, the overtraining, the types, again, the types of people uh, it attracts, it's a perfect recipe for eating disorders, body image issues, hammered and, and damaged bodies and hormones. And it's just, it's got to be one of the, the most unhealthy places uh, to compete, uh, re you know, regardless of sports. It's just it just doesn't seem like a good idea for most people. So if you're thinking about doing it, like really, really consider you, all the stuff that we just mentioned. You know, uh, uh, Rochelle is in our forum, and I got her like this. She had already kind of gone through this with other coaches and stuff like that, and we we linked up. And so she's a great person. So if you're listening to this, you're a competitor, you're in our forum, you're thinking about getting in there, but uh, get a chance that she's amazing too. Like she's uh, an open book. She'll share like her experience both before me and then after coaching with me. And I think she's she's full of wisdom, very very smart, um, and and will share. And she's completely natural athlete and looked incredible uh, after we got ready for a couple of shows. So talk to her if you're in our forum. Next caller is Nate from Texas. What's up, Nate? How can we help you? What's going on, y'all? How y'all doing, man? Good, 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 man. What's up? Hey, man, I just want to say it's exciting, man. It's good to it's good to be able to be on here, man, because uh, this is like something so new for me. I don't, I've never actually been involved in some stuff like this, so it's cool. It's cool, man. <laughs> uh, so I just want to say I appreciate y'all. Everything y'all do, man, is cool. Y'all send a just a super positive message. The vibes y'all send, y'all help so many people. So I just want to say that off the rip. Uh, now my my whole my whole deal here is that I I've been training for a while, man. I've been, you know, implementing a lot of different things, and I've been learning all this new stuff. I've actually been studying to be a personal trainer now. Um, and when I'm when I'm trying to create these programs, what's going on is I'm, I'm learning. You know, I need to incorporate all these different planes of motion. You know, and I need to I need to make sure I'm doing transverse. Uh, I need to you know, I need to incorporate sagittal and frontal, but when I'm creating a single workout, you know, I'm trying to figure out, is it best for me to incorporate all the three planes of motion into one workout, or should I try to like phase different planes of motion? Now, I know that like when you're doing like speed and agility and balance, you really kind of want to focus uh, your, your attention on certain like uh, performance aspects, but when I'm doing a single workout, you know, sometimes I get caught in the, in the mode where I just want to, I want to do all these bench press and, and all these rows and I want to do these pull-ups and, you know, when I feel like for the general public, the best way for the general public would be to kind of incorporate a little bit of everything. But then again, in one single workout, I also feel like it's best to just focus on certain things at, at one time. So that's really my, my issue is when I'm creating a single workout, how is it best to incorporate either all three planes of motion or should I be phasing or breaking it up into different segments? Yeah, Nate. Cool, so cool question. Welcome yeah. to the world of, of personal training. So he, he, <laughs> yeah. here's your answer. They're both right. So yeah, yeah. It depends. Right. Who, yeah. So it depends who you're working with, uh, what the goal is, the rep ranges, if you're focusing on strength or speed yeah. or – just what body health. parts, general health. I mean, both are fine. Both are totally fine. I would You're look right. at I would look at a little bit more broad. So maybe throughout the week, you definitely want to incorporate all uh, three planes of motion in one workout. You don't necessarily have to. I mean, you can do, you know, squats, overhead press, bench press, and rows, 
in one workout, and then the next workout, now you can incorporate some something you know rotational lateral. Um, right. So I would look at it more like that, but it depends who I'm working with and what their goals are and how their body's moving. And so this is why it's it's an almost impossible question to answer. I think the general answer for the general person would be to make sure you incorporate all of them throughout the week, I, yeah. I would say. Yeah. But again, that can change depending on the person I'm working with. With some people, I would do it every workout. And with other people, I would maybe do it a little less if we need to focus more. Like if I'm just focusing on strength, like I got a, yeah. I got a, a kid I'm training, we're trying to pack on some muscle and some strength, or not necessarily playing any sports, then I'm going to be okay avoiding certain planes of motion when I'm just trying to pack on mass. And then later on, I'm going to start to incorporate more of those planes of motion. It depends right. on the person. It really does. So there's no clear, you know, I can't give you a, a straight 100% answer with this one. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you'll notice, I, I bet you've gone through like our mass performance and like, I, I don't know if you've gone through. I just it. haven't had a chance, man. Okay. I, I've got so much stuff going on. I got kids and everything else. It's yeah. just been a, yeah. it's kind of tough getting into stuff, but uh, well, it's more of a, like a personal deal. I want to be able to figure it out, you know, within myself, you know, it, it's just like y'all say it. You're always it, you're always the worst trainer for yourself, you know? So like <laughs> yeah, I, sure. I, I focus on a lot of stuff myself, but then whenever I'm able to talk to other people, I can give such good advice, but it's so hard to follow it. So I really want to learn more for myself that way I can show other people. And that's really where I'm at. Yeah. What I was alluding to was we actually had like a devoted section, a phase uh, for multiplanar movement in um, that was intentional because of the lack of of that focus in a lot of programming, especially when you mentioned, um, you know, just real strength pursuits uh, where we're trying to reduce it down to just a few exercises that give you the most bang uh, that are usually bilateral loaded uh, and it's in the sagittal plane. And so, you know, it can, it's nice and controlled that way. So we can build a nice base, uh, you right. know, in terms of strength, but uh, what, where your mindset is, I think is great because we really do need to, um, consider all those different other functions that the body's capable of. So that way we don't, um, you know, sort of prune that off to where we're yeah, not, we don't effective. want to miss it out. Right. So, so I do think that, um, incorporating a phase specific is, you know, an option of, you know, sprinkling them in, in terms of complementary exercises to the strength phases you could do. Uh, so yeah, there really isn't like a, a very definitive answer to this other than just keep that in mind that there's, um, you know, these other planes we need to consider and keep that movement happening. I listen that you, uh, you've already won half the battle. The fact that you recognize the importance of it and that you're trying to figure out how to program it, you're already ahead of the game. Well, so, and, and basically saying the same thing that the guys are saying, the reason why no one's giving you this definitive answer is because you could, you could play with this. I mean, that's the fun part about being a trainer is that you, you know, you recognize the importance of incorporating all the different planes. And so, you know, maybe one client, I decide I'm going to do a phase like Justin was just talking about how we do in performance. Then maybe another client, I'm just going to do a day, right? So maybe I have like what Sal was saying, like a kid who's really focused on being strong and that is his main goal that he's telling me. But I also recognize the importance of training in different planes with him. So maybe the, you know, two or three of the workouts during the week are very, you know, MAPS anabolic strength type of programming, very sagittal plane based, the same kind of planes of motion. And then one day a week, I have a, a whole day dedicated to all the other planes and we do right. some dynamic stuff in there. And so there's a lot of different ways that you can play where every day I incorporate a rotational transverse plane type. So you could do some fun stuff here and, and play around with it. And it does really, like Sal was saying, depend on the client's goal. Mm -hmm. Whatever the client's goal is, I want to spend a bulk of my time addressing that adaptation, whatever yeah, it may be, whether okay. it be building strength, uh, body fat, you know, sculpting and, and, and developing a certain muscle. That's where the bulk of my programming is. But as, uh, you know, keeping integrity as a trainer and knowing that it's important for overall joint health and longevity, I want to make sure they can train in all planes. I'm going to incorporate it at least yeah. somewhat within the program. And how much of that would really depend on how focused they are or how much I think they need that, like, or how much they're potentially lacking it. And you can, you yeah. can accomplish this too, through mobility drills, uh, in ways of doing that without a loaded, 
uh, exercise. Yeah, so, good. you know, you can, you can do this as primers. We do this before our workouts even uh, to address uh, certain rotational movements and joint function. So that way we get it to respond better within the workouts. Um, so, yeah, there's just a lot of ways you can sort of implement this, not just uh, having to prescribe the entire workout devoted to multiple planes. Nate, do, Nate, do you have yeah. mass performance? I, I don't. Uh, you, I just you do now. I haven't had yeah. a chance. Yeah. I haven't really had a chance go, to go, go through, through it. But, uh, we, you, we're going to send it to you, okay? Yeah, yeah we're going to send it over hey, to you. Bro, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm super appreciative. Like, I, that's really one of the things I've really been wanting to do is actually run a, a, a real program. A good one, uh, good, good you know, deal. but that's that's like I'm super appreciative. So fo that. follow Thank that, you. follow that program, Nate. And then after you go through that, from what we've just talked to you about, I think you'll have a really good idea yeah, on yeah. how to go from there and incorporate it for okay. your clients. Yeah. There's a lot of different tools in there and there's a lot of different ways that you can use the tools in there for your future clients. And but the one thing I think you should do and, and stick to it, follow the program as it's laid out so you can get the full benefits of everything that we did in there. And then after that, you can pluck and pull whatever you like and implement it into your yeah. own program. Thank, thanks for calling awesome. in, Nate. I appreciate hey, it. Hey, man. Thank y'all, man. Y'all keep being good. Keep being you, man. Y'all doing so much great stuff, man. I appreciate you. Thank, thank you, Nate. Nate. Thank you. I like Nate. Love that dude's energy. Yeah, no, I love, that, love guy. that guy's energy. Yeah, you know, with the when it comes to the different planes, I, what you said, Justin, was I'm so glad you said that. You don't have to do loaded hypertrophy-based exercises in all the planes mm -hmm. necessarily. You can do, you know, much of that in the maybe sagittal plane and then do dynamic mobility stuff in some of the other Well, planes. especially since the yep. point you brought up about, you know, if you had a kid, let's say 25-year-old kid, relatively pretty healthy, good mobility, good decent movement, not dealing with any sort of joint pain, anything, just wants to get big, build some yeah, muscle. We're going to focus on strength yeah, in the sagittal yeah, plane. Yeah, 90, the majority of it. 90% of the workout's going to look very MAPS anabolic S, but then you can take elements from like performance and mobility days yeah. like Justin, it's a great point and you just just to keep that just to keep them mobile in different now parts. i will say when it comes to building a, a balanced symmetrical physique even just from an aesthetic standpoint focusing on the different planes is a bit of a hack because it does work all the muscles of the body and does develop a lot of balance and you know aesthetics isn't just how you look when you're stationary mm -hmm. there's aesthetics with how you walk and move and training in those different planes develops aesthetic movement. So we, we've all seen the meathead in the gym that if you posed for a picture would look okay, but then you see them moving, something doesn't look right. And oftentimes that comes from just lack of movement ability in different planes. They always train in one particular way. Well, this is the reason why we were all very adamant about the second program being performance. Totally. Right? I mean, in the, in the ideal world, pretty much regardless of your goal, whether it's overall health, fat loss, muscle building. Yeah, I don't care. doesn't matter what yeah. your goal is. The ideal way to follow the pro programs where we laid them out is anabolic first, performance, and then aesthetic. From there, there's lots of different pathways, and we can get into customizing it. But for the general population, regardless of your goals, we really tried to address all the main things we'd want a client to focus on in those three programs. Our next caller is Parth from Massachusetts. What's up, Parth? How can we help you? Hey, guys. Um, first of all, I, I really want to thank you. I've been listening to Mind Pump for around two years now. And um, earlier, I used to hate doing daily chores like doing the dishes, laundry, or cooking. Now I look forward to them since I always have Mind Pump on. Yeah. So, well, tell, your, tell your wife you're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> Are you putting so, those dish, uh, are you putting those dishes away right in the dishwasher? <laughs> yeah, that makes a difference. <laughs> Hopefully. Yeah. So I have two questions, uh, both kind of unrelated to each other. The second question is more topical since we just had uh, Valentine's Day. So, uh, so my first question is about training volume. Uh, just to give you some background, I used to be overweight in 2019. Um, I read Bigger, Leaner, Stronger and learned about calorie deficit. And then I got down to 10% uh, body fat. Wow. Uh, so, so since last year, I've been really trying to lean bulk, uh, and I have been following uh, the BLS routine since November, but I feel like my volume is inadequate uh, since I'm gaining around 1.5 to 2 pounds uh, per week. So my calorie intake is on point. I, I track my sleep. Uh, I'm a consistent person in general. So my first question is, uh, how do you really know if you are doing too few exercises or sets or volume, and should I be uh, changing my routine? Ooh, that's a good question. Well, first off, your Mike Matthews is a good friend of ours, and he's got good information. So, if you're following something that he's recommending, chances are you're doing most things right. Okay, so 
Let's now put that aside for a second. Let me ask you a few questions. You said you're getting mm -hmm. one and a half to two pounds of body fat a week. Are you tracking body fat percentage as well? Um, so I have like an in-body scanner at home, which isn't really accurate, but it sort of helps me identify trends. And so I know my body fat percentage is going uh, up. Okay. Is it how, like how, I mean, because here's the thing that from just first glance, the the pound to two pounds a week is not necessarily bad. And the fact that we know that you're you're going to probably put on a little bit of body fat, how is it uh, is it moving relatively fast compared to where you? I mean, and what you said was mm -hmm. perfect too. You're watching trends, right? So that's what matters most is where you were before you trend on the in body scan. Where were you uh, before Absolutely. you started the bulk, and then where are you now? Yeah. So so close to. So this is again. Uh, these are not accurate numbers since it's the machine. So uh, I'm just identifying trends. But basically in August 2020, the machine showed that my body fat percentage was around 10, 11%. And right now I'm at 19%. Okay. Uh, okay. And I'm, I'm, I weigh uh, 195 pounds. Uh, back then when I was at my leanest, I was 157. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. So, yeah, I mean, you, the way that I would judge the fat gain, muscle gain, or the way I would correct that is really with my caloric intake. So I would bring the calories down a little bit. You might be in too much of a caloric surplus. Now, in regards to your workouts, uh, are you getting stronger? Do you Are you building good muscle? Do you feel improvements in performance? If the answer to that is yes, then you're doing, you're okay. Now, if the answer okay. to that is no, um, then the other questions I would ask are, do you feel excessively sore, fatigued, stiff, or inflamed? If the answer is yes to that, then I'd say you're doing too much volume not the other way around. Now, if you're not gaining muscle and you're not getting super sore, you're not feeling stiffness, you feel really good, uh, then maybe you can increase some volume in your workouts. But it really depends on on those things. Let's talk about the calories a little bit. Where where were you uh, in the cut? Yeah. And then where were you? What where are you at now, calorie wise? So what's tell me yeah, absolutely. So so my TDE is around twenty five hundred. Uh, my when I uh, when I'm on my lean bulk, I usually eat around twenty nine hundred. And uh, when I was cutting, I was eating around 2,200. So those are the numbers. And uh, I'm doing around 0.5 to 0.8 uh, uh, of protein per pound. So it's around 155, 156 grams of protein. Uh, and I also track my my fat and carbs. So okay. it sounds like you got, I mean, you sound like you're in pretty good, but the only difference I'd probably make is when you went from 22, maybe I'd go to like 25. Yeah. yeah just maybe. I, I just did the math on your body, and I hope I'm right here. I just did the math on your body fat percentage, lean body mass. So your lean body mass, your body fat, sorry, your total weight was 157 at 10% body fat. Mm -hmm. Now you're 190 at 19% body fat? That's correct. Uh, so, according to the machine, yes. Okay. So your lean body mass went from 141 to 153. That's pretty if, damn good. That's not bad. Yeah. But he also went from 157 to 190. Right, which is why I think that you just a little too much calories. But that's everything a, else is pretty good. Like yeah. when what Sal was alluding to earlier about you know if you're getting stronger and we're putting muscle on, there's not a problem with the volume of training. Your volume gotcha. of your volume of training is is probably on spot on, and you're doing just fine. You're probably just either one underestimating how many calories you're actually eating or you just didn't need that much and so i would just uh, instead of doing 28 2900 i'd probably pull back more like 24 2500 yeah. and see how your body responds well can you tell me gotcha. i'm not as familiar with his programming in terms of like rep range and like what mm -hmm. we're switching up uh, phase wise like what yeah. what does that look like for you and have you done like a one to five rep range mm -hmm. yeah absolutely so bls usually has uh, around four exercises three of them are compound movements and then the one is usually in isolation. Mm -hmm. So on a typical chest day, you have a incline bench press, normal bench press, and then incline bench press with dumbbells, and then probably a rear fly. So you usually have uh, three compounds and one isolation, and you're supposed to go, you're supposed to do three hard sets for each of these compounds. Mm -hmm. uh, and the rep range is uh, usually four to uh, seven, four to eight. Yeah, you're, you're, it's a body part split, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So it's... Uh, yeah, it's, it's a four-day routine. I, I am following the four-day routine, but it's uh, upper, lower, um, core. Throw them on and performance then, uh, or aesthetic. Yeah, yeah I was going to say, now how often have you switched that up in terms of, you know, like changing all the acute variables? Uh, yeah, it's been a while. Uh, I haven't switched it up since uh, November last year. Yeah, that would be my Ma recommendation. Parth, yeah. let's, um, we're going to MAPS Anabolic. Parth, I'm going to send you MAPS Anabolic. So I love Mike. He's got awesome. great programming. I think we're a little better just because we've been <laughs> we've been we've, we've trained a lot of people. We want to provide you new stimulus. Yeah, but no, Mike's Mike's great. Okay, but yeah. I'm gonna have you. I'm gonna send you Nothing Maps Anabolic. Mike. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to Maps Anabolic, 
Do three foundation. So there's two options. There's two or three foundational workouts a week. I want you to do the three foundational workouts a week. And then mm-hmm. on every other off day, I want you to do three trigger sessions a day. So let's switch gotcha. to that program and you should see faster muscle growth and a boost in metabolism. I think it wouldn't hurt you also to maybe reduce calories a little bit. So, you know, maybe okay. not go all the way down to what your cut was at 22, maybe land somewhere around 25, 26 yeah. and see how you feel with also gotcha. switching the stimulus with the new programming. Those two things, I think we should see uh, nice. I, I, hopefully, if we do a really good job, you actually don't see the scale move too much. You feel like you're getting a little stronger and a little leaner. Mm-hmm. If we hit the if we hit you right where we want to calorie wise, uh, and right. with the new stimulus, we should kind of see that response. So the other part I want to do so we can keep up with you because I'm very curious to see how your body responds when we do this is uh, let's throw you. You're not in our private forum, are you? No. All right, I'm gonna have Doug put you in our private forum. So make sure you uh, awesome. look for access in the Facebook private Mind Pump private forum, mm-hmm. and then I would just love to get some updates from you. Just tag when anytime you get in the forum and you write anything uh, to make sure that one of us sees it. Just make sure you tag us, and then mm-hmm. uh, we'll keep an eye on uh, how the programming and everything is going. Yeah, and, and that's that's wonderful. That's actually a, a great segue to my next question. Um, so uh, so I actually recently moved in with my girlfriend. And uh, before her, I used to be super laser focused with my tracking calories, uh, like in the last two, two and a half months. And so now that we cook and eat together, uh, tracking has actually gotten much harder, even though I still track. Uh, So my question is, what are some strategies you would recommend for tracking and staying focused for nutrition, even when you are sharing food with someone who doesn't really track well, yeah. since since you're washing get a, get all a the new girlfriend, since no. you're washing all the dishes, doing all the laundry, and doing all the chores, I would I would ruin everything. Yeah, I would I would say, look, I'm doing all the chores. You need to weigh and measure my food. Make so sure so p- here's what here's what I do with uh, when so Katrina actually used to cook for me, and we'd actually eat no- relatively normal meals for somebody who was prepping for shows. Um, so and it, and I only had to do it one one time. It does it's a little bit of work the first time, but. Yeah, and th- I think this is the easy way to do when you like. Let's say you make like so. She makes this quinoa pasta dish. I love. It reminds me of like lasagna. It's got some. Gra- it's got ground beef or ground turkey we put in it. But what I do is the the first time that she preps it, I actually calculate everything that's going in it. Right, because I'm not going to eat that whole pan in one sitting, but I can figure out the total protein in there, the total carbs, the total fat, and the whole dish. And then based off of how many squares I have, did I eat a quarter of it? Did I eat half of it? Did I eat three quarters of it? I can get a, a, a more accurate estimation on a on a dish that would be really hard for people to track. Where people go wrong is they don't calculate all that up and they just kind of try and guess. They like try a, afterwards. Yeah, they try afterwards to try and figure it out. And that can get really tough to estimate your calories. And then once I've done that one time, you know, I, I don't know how what you guys are like, but, you know, I tend to rotate through the mm-hmm. same 10 dinners or so, you know what I'm saying? Like, and once I've got it written down one time, I've got a pretty good estimation on how many calories, how much protein, which are the two main things that I'm really paying attention to when I'm tracking, uh, does, does this dish have and how much of that dish, what, what fraction of that did I eat of that dish? Cause I'm probably going to put the other half in the refrigerator. I can kind of figure out that's my recommendation on trying to do, trying to you know, eat normal with a girlfriend and have, you know, prepare meals like that is it's a little, little work at the beginning to track and figure out what the total amount is in the dish. But once I got that down, anytime I go re- like another thing I love to do is like a big chili dish, rich that's got all kinds mm-hmm. of stuff in it, uh, which would be really hard to figure out if I'm just like spooning it in from this big pot. But if I know what the yeah. total pot is, I, c- I have a better guesstimation on what I'm probably consuming. And does that make sense? Absolutely. No, cool. that's, that's really helpful. Cool. Right. Um, Thank you. Yeah, and so before we uh, end this conversation, I just have one quick message for for your audience. So, um, so until seven months ago, um, I used to be the guy who would straight away skip to questions and answers, since I felt that that's where I got most value. And boy, I was wrong. Uh, soon enough, I realized that uh, I ha- soon enough I realized what I had been missing out on, and how much fun and info packed the introductions are. So, uh, so my advice is don't be that guy. Uh, <laughs> it's 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 like skipping leg day so that's just my advice i love, I love that advice uh, i love thank that you, i love that bro Appreciate thank you it. thank you Parth. thanks Parth. see thank you, you see you in the forum nice man you thank you all right yeah that's uh i mean he was, he was on track you're just eating a little too much yeah no yeah. It, you know yeah. what At, now after we heard the second question 
he's probably underestimating what he's eating. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, and he's uh, happy. He's probably yeah, in love. Yeah, yeah. How that is. Yeah, yeah. but I, I mean, as far as everything else, I mean, I, th I think he's he's pretty damn close. Yeah. I bet you the only thing that's happening is that he he probably increased a little more than he needed, mm -hmm. and or he was also probably uh, undercalculating what. Or he's just like dinner is really the big. Uh, totally. yeah. That's yeah. why I use that. That's why I use that uh, example is what we would do, and that's what Katrina and I would do it. It would be a little laborious. The the first, like what, getting it all tracked one yeah, time. But you know, there's two pounds of meat in here. There's, that's right. Yeah, a pound of pasta or whatever. Yeah, and, and, and it's, pay attention to that and it's one e meal. Yeah, and then it's easier to estimate. It, normally, I would eat half of whatever it is. She normally yeah. eats about a quarter. There's normally you know another quarter, quarter and a half that's left over, and I can get an idea of okay, what I. Just consume. Yeah, and, and I just learned something too from this question, and that is that we help people do chores. So if your partner <laughs> yeah. is not doing enough chores, have them hey, listen man. to Mind Pump. Doing good things. Our next caller is Yinkon from Missouri. What's up, Yinkon? How can we help you? Hey, guys. Uh, first off, I just want to really thank you guys. Um, appreciate the time uh, to you know take my call. Um, basically, uh, let me start off by kind of telling you guys how I got back into, uh, I guess, just getting more fit. Um, in August of 2021, um, I decided, you know, I wanted to try to see if I can be a live donor for my brother, kidney donor. So um, I was trying to talk to him, like ask him like what the process was. And he was saying, no, like, don't worry about it. You know, you got a family and kids. Um, so I ended up finding it out myself and um i was trying to take like the preliminary stuff to, to take the tests and um basically they rejected me because you know 5 10 2 35 they were like yeah you're like obesely overweight and i was trying to make my case like look i still play volleyball like i play sports like on a daily basis and and stuff they're just like your bmi is like way off the charts like you'd have to lose some weight so that kind of kick-started everything, and um, I got down to 195 by November, um, and then I just uh, kept I, – I did it again, and they, uh, they accepted me that time. But um, long story short, it didn't happen because uh, it, with it being his second donor, it would have had to be like a blood and, um, and uh, uh, antibody match, and we weren't that. But um, basically, like – it really like woke me up because I was like, what am I doing with my life? Cause you know, he was like in the hospital, like two, three times a year with like blood poisoning and stuff. And like, I'm just here, like in the, like the heartland of America, just like eating just crap food and stuff. And so I like, was like, I know I lost the weight like horribly. It was like the worst way to do it. Um, and so I was like, I need to find out like, you know, ways to, you know, get myself in, in a shape better and in healthier ways. And so I found you guys and, um, basically, um, I'm currently at 184 right now. I have, uh, a couple goals in mind. Um, I feel like they're pretty ambitious for what I want to do, but at the same time, it's like kind of everywhere for one, I want to be able to dunk a ball, uh, basketball, and I want to be able to get into the 1000 club. Um, but this last month we actually just found out, uh, we're going to be moving to Malaysia in July. So um, my wife's got a job there and I'm going to be able to, you know, be a stay at home dad for a little bit, uh, work on some coding stuff. But um, it's got me like really flustered because I feel like I'm in a really good spot, like in terms of like where, like my journey of fitness. And I'm just like, kind of like, how do you deload or if you, that's even, you know, an option or like, you know, um, what do I do to kind of prep for that move? And once I get there, like what's something I can do while looking for a gym? Yeah. Good question. Okay. So whenever I would go travel or whenever I'd have a client travel and they weren't going to work out while they were gone, I wouldn't deload lead up, leading up to the vacation or the travel. I would actually push them a little bit past over training mm. so that that time off is more recovery. So in other words, let's say I'm not going to work out for two weeks or a week. I'm going to train even harder, a little bit more volume leading up to it so that that time off, a lot of it is recovery and, and recuperating, and it kind of helps balance out that time off. That's That would be my approach. So I wouldn't deload. Okay. I would work out hard, maybe even harder leading up to the time off. Now, while you're gone, if do you have maps anywhere? 
Um, I don't. I I'm sorry. I should have mentioned. I'm a new. I'm a new listener. I started listening to you guys in uh, back in December. Okay, I'll send you maps anywhere. It's uh, a workout program. It requires okay. no equipment except for resistance bands. It's an exceptional workout program. It blew up during the pandemic when gyms are locked down, and people loved it so much that uh, now people are incorporating it all the time in the routine. So we're going to send that over to you. It's a great program. Follow that until you find a gym you can work out in. Can we send um, them anabolic yeah. for now, though? Because when when do you actually leave? Because wouldn't you, uh, wouldn't you want them doing like anabolic right now and then switch to anywhere? Yeah, wait, wait, are you, how long do you have? Oh, you said you're moving in July, so you got some time, right? Yeah, yeah, run mm-hmm. anabolic now. Well, either anabolic or something even higher volume leading up to it, like MAPS Aesthetic, uh-huh. um, just to get you, like I said, to that point where you're pushing a little past and then you have that recovery. While you're, mm-hmm. How long do you think you're not going to work out for, by the way? I'm hoping not too long because like I kind of go crazy if I don't do anything (laughs) so um I mean I've kind of like googled places around and our first thing is like we're gonna be stuck uh pretty much like like at a workplace for at least a month until we can like buy a car out there and every gym's like at least 10 minutes away got it prx yeah yeah I'm gonna send I'm gonna send you uh maps anabolic yeah and and lead lead up to it and then as soon as you can't you don't have equipment do maps anywhere Mm -hmm. you can literally do it anywhere so you need no equipment for it just get yourself some good resistance bands you'll be totally set awesome well I really appreciate that guys thank you so much yeah no problem Mm -hmm. Yeah, did you guys ever do that with clients where they would have time off so you train them a little harder? Oh, yeah, totally. Time off? Yeah. The one thing I wanted to address with him that we, we didn't get a chance to kind of get into was he he admittedly said that he lost all that weight, probably the unhealthy the way. way. So yeah. I'm assuming that meant a lot of cardio and low right. calorie. So my concern was just throwing him into like a high volume program again. Yeah, no, I see that. Yeah. So anabolic was the direction I thought we should take him first to build yeah. up his metabolism. He's got time before he goes in July. Plus, plus he's got. I mean, he's not going to have that much time off with anywhere. You with that program, literally, you're in, you can work out in a closet with that program. Right. With no equipment. And then the other thing that you know, here's. Uh, I mean, it's a plug for our partner PRX. Like. Um, a lot of people don't know this, but they have this they have this set up to where it's like paying a membership. So if you, I mean, obviously if you buy a whole gym set up for your garage, that is awesome, like their setup is, it could be pretty expensive to do it all at once. So they offer it to do like a payment plan. So mm-hmm. it's like, it hits you like a, yeah. a gym membership. So, you know, if he, uh, I understand that moving can be expensive. He may not be working right now. So asking him to spend $10,000 on equipment was probably unrealistic. Yeah, you pay monthly like a membership. But yeah, if you were going to go get a membership at a gym anyways, uh, it, it's probably not going to be that much more. And now mm-hmm. you have it in your house so you don't have to go anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a good way to do it. Plus, they give you a lot of different options for bundles. So that way you just get the essentials you need to keep it going. So yeah, that's, that's a great option to have. Excellent. Look, if you like our information, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out our guides. We have guides that can help you with almost any fitness goal. You can also find all of us on social media. So Justin is on Instagram at mindpumpjustin. Adam is on Instagram at mindpumpadam. And you can find me on Twitter at mindpumpsal.